I'm going. Oh, excuse me. I'm going to call the um, yes Tuesday twenty eighth or January twenty eighth of twenty twenty a regular governing board meeting to order at seven o one. Um, roll call. We are all here, and we will stand for the pledge of allegiance, and we will um, remain standing for a moment of silence. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <laughs> Thank you. Ready? I'm not sure. Being this far to the I move we adopt the agenda. I second. All those in all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, we can start with governing board reports, Ms. Tweedy. I don't have a report. Mrs. Reed. Um, over the last two weeks, I've had the opportunity to visit um, Bel Air Esperanza um, New River at their community celebration. They turned 85, um, and that was an amazing um, birthday party celebration for that community. Um, I also attended the pop luncheon at Barry Goldwater High School um, that was held at Avenue 27. Um, again, a plug for Avenue 27. If you haven't had a chance to dine there, um, please make a reservation before they're um, done with their season. Um, they have amazing food and uh, they just won some huge awards over the weekend. Uh, I think uh, Dr. Stolk is two of them won 31,000 over $31,000 in, in scholarship money. Awesome. $135,000 total scholarships for um, Avenue 27, which is amazing. So congratulations um, to Chef Ryan and to those students. Um, I also um, was at Deer Valley High School for a little bit um, and then was at Mountain Shadows for the Leader and Me celebration, which is one of my most favorite days of the whole school year because um, the celebration is 100% student driven and student led. Um, there was a team of 12 students from kindergarten through sixth grade who planned the whole celebration. Um, we had a six year old who made a video and it was amazing to see um, what she thought uh, leadership was. Um, through her video and it was just warms my heart so much to just watch um, their mind shifts change and to watch their leadership in action. Um, yesterday and today I had an opportunity to be at the Phoenix Open, the Waste Management Phoenix Open, throwing um, a baby shower with Operation Shower and um, it was such an amazing event. We honored um, military moms that are stationed here, uh, either they're stationed here or their husbands are stationed here. Um, we had a couple sets of twins and some brand new babies got my baby fixed today with that. And then a special highlight was um, seeing one of our former students um, from Sandra Day O'Connor, um, Amy, and she is a huge, um, huge golf fan. She won some national recognition last year at the Open. And so she was one of the guests um, for the PGA at the luncheon today. Um, and then Monday, I had an opportunity to go down to the legislature and testify on behalf of House Bill 2625, which is the Sandra Day O'Connor Civics Day Bill, um, which, if passed, would mark September 25th as Sandra Day O'Connor Civics Day across the state. So um, I testified um, for that. Um, I, so that's kind of the activities I, I've had. Um, in addition to that, I've had... Um, hours and hours of conversations with parents and principals mm -hmm. and concerned community members regarding um, not only boundaries, um, but special ed open enrollment in regards to boundaries. And um, I, you know, sent a ton of questions and I know it was deemed the grocery list of, of things that Mrs. Reed um, needed clarification on. Um, but I would like to um, request that we have a discussion regarding um, 
our open enrollment policy for um, special education students, I think that there's a lot of miscommunication and a lot of um, things maybe that the governing board needs to um, have some eyes on and, and things that we might need to discuss together to just examine that, especially since we are looking at the open enrollment policy. Um, so I am happy to send some more questions specifically with data um, just so that we, we have those when we have that discussion. Um, and then the other point, and, and I know that I've brought it up before, and I know that several of my other governing board members have brought it up before, but there seems to be a um, just a lack of communication or um, a lot of miscommunication that's going on in the district. And um, I know that Mrs. Allred works quite a bit. I don't know if she ever sees her husband or sleeps or eats. Um, and I'm pretty sure that she has a, a cot in her office. Um, and so my concern is um, the workload that is coming out of our communications department. Um, when we have emergencies from school and we have boundary issues and we have other things in the district um, that are extremely important, um, and a new school opening and a school being repurposed, there's a lot of information that needs to be shared. And um, I don't know if Mrs. Allred has the capacity within herself to do all of those things and still be a sane human being. So um, I would like to request some uh, more information and I did send it in an email, but um, some more information regarding budget to see where our communications department stands as far as budgeting and as we continue to to um, to grow and expand and our programs are growing and expanding and social media um, takes hold and we need to get information out immediately um, if we need to look at um, adding another position in our communications department or getting um, additional help and resources to um, Mrs. Allred. I don't like to find out about important things um, from a text message from another parent who saw it in the news or on social media. I would like to find out these things from our district first. So with that, I will pass the torch to Mrs. O'Brien. Yes, Mrs. O'Brien. Thank you. Um, so it's been a very busy couple of weeks, so I'll just uh, highlight a couple of additional events on top of Mrs. Reed's. Uh, I want to thank Dr. Stoltz for um, being flexible and um, vis uh, visit from Senator Carter. So she, Senator Carter came and visited uh, Barry Goldwater yesterday morning and received a lovely tour and is so excited to um, maybe host an event of her own at Avenue 27 uh, sometime in the future. But she was very impressed by what is going on at Barry Goldwater High School. So thank you folks for, for being so flexible and doing that um, uh, almost on the last minute notice. Uh, also got to uh, join Mrs. Reed down at the Capitol to talk about the Civics Celebration Day. Um, and it does uh, require, because it, it did make me a little nervous about additional work for uh, our districts or teachers, but it does require ADE to put together um, activities and resources from which districts will pull for that so that it, we don't bear the full burden of that. And it also gives our district um, flexibility. It's not also just prescribed to that, so we can add um, stuff if we would like. The other thing I was able to, or the other thing I did do was attend um, the West Ed board meeting last week. And West Ed is our research development and service agency that works with education and other communities to promote excellence, achieve equity, and improve learning for youth and adults. And Every meeting I go to is more and more valuable. This uh, session, we got to hear from Mark Schneider, who is the director of the Institute of Science, uh, Education Sciences. Um, he is doing some impressive things with uh, taking, this is impressive to me because if you write a 100-page report in doctor at doctoral level words. A lot of people don't read them all. So he is on a mission to make sure re reports get down to about 15 pages and um, are short sentences and strong verbs, which is, I think, a wonderful thing to help folks out in the community, education community, look at what is evidence-based and how can we implement those things 
um, in our school districts to make sure we're making a difference and utilizing our dollars uh, as effectively and efficiently as possible. We also had a federal policy update, and I will um, give that, ask Ms. Taylor if she would please scan it in and share it with all the board members so we can have that as well. Um, one of the other things we focused on was the importance of principal supervisors. Um, we know that Dr. Finch is very, um, what is very important to him are his principals because they have um, a lot of pressure to make sure their campuses are running well and their students are achieving. And one of the things that uh, West Ed will be focusing on with ADE is making sure that we're, there are evidence-based ways for principal supervisors because we teach principals how to evaluate teachers, but who's evaluating our principals and making sure that we have good principals in our building. I think that Dr. Finch and his staff are doing a lot of things that they're talking about studying, and I'd like to share um, our cabinet's information with some folks at ADE so we can maybe be a resource for them. And I will share one more flyer with Sheila to share with you all, but there um, is a on the IES, there is Ask A-R-E-L, and there are a lot of studies out there. I shared one with Dr. Galligan regarding the implementation of standard-based grading and how parents perceive that. So um, there's a lot of good information, and um, I will be traveling on Thursday to the National School Board Association Advocacy Institute and um, Equity uh, a symposium as well. So I look forward to bringing back and sharing with all of you that information from those two events. Thank you. Oh, I have a couple questions. I'm sorry. Oh, you go ahead. I do. I apologize. Um, I know that the budget committee has been meeting, and I was wondering uh, if you could just let us know in the next update when we'll be receiving information, maybe at a meeting, or if it's coming in an update, kind of what the status is on uh, where that budget committee is. I know that there was a survey that went out and I'd like to understand where we're at in that process. Um, the other, I have an agenda request, which is the superintendent's performance pay goals. I think we are a little behind in having a meeting to review uh, where we're at with those. And then, sorry, this is a note back for budget. I apologize for jumping all over, but the budget, this budget season, is it going to be possible for us to see the budget at the school level? And I think that previously, um, Mrs. Tweedy had asked about coach evaluations. Is that coach evaluations? And so I don't know, I don't remember if we got anything back about how our coaches evaluate in our district. I know we do teacher evaluations and employee evaluations, and I'm not sure. Um, if we do that, and if you could provide something in a future update about that, that would be awesome. Thank you. Mrs. Uh, O'Brien, when you said the school budget, you mean the individual campus budgets, oh, correct? Correct. Okay, I just wanted to make that clear. Okay, thank you. And Ms. Frank. Okay, so I, I'd like to I try not to make everybody uh, impair their hearing with my shouting into the new microphones. Um, first of all, I would like to thank all of the many community members who emailed me over the past. And oh, I've got to get just the right distance from this. Okay. Uh, I don't always have time to respond to every single email. That doesn't mean that I don't read them and I don't consider them. I do. So I do want everyone who emailed me uh, to know that and to know that I appreciate it. Um, hearing your thoughts and your concerns about some of the issues we have going on in the district. There is one email, though, that I do want to address um, that I received uh, last week, uh, and that's because I think there, this, uh, the author of this email uh, showed some uh, misconceptions and misunderstandings about one of our programs that we offer with and generally, when one person has a misconception and they email you, probably at least 25 more people with the same misunderstanding who didn't email you. So I do want to, uh, hopefully the microphone will cooperate. I do want to um, set the record straight. So this particular uh, community member had emailed me regarding the uh, proposed boundary changes and the comparison between the two affected uh, school, or two of the affected schools, Deer Valley High School and Mountain Ridge. And so this person wrote, and again, I'm not mentioning any names because the purpose of this is not to shame for an email that they sent 
set the record straight about a program. Uh, for example, I know for a fact that Deer Valley High School has been provided two state counselors for school to work program while all the other schools in the district only require one and most of those counselors actually split time between two different schools. I will not argue the testing scores or ranking of schools since it was clear that the board does not agree with that system. However, you cannot argue with needing more state assistance in order to have their students become functioning members of society. Well, if I agreed with that, then we would both be wrong. That's um, a misunderstanding of the Transition School to Work program. The Transition School to Work program assists students with disabilities with the transition process from high school to employment or post-secondary education. In order to be eligible for this program, a student must have a documented disability that is a barrier to employment. They also must apply interview and be accepted into the program. Now, when they're accepted into the program, they attend classes at their high school that are taught by a certified Deer Valley teacher. Uh, the DES does provide vocational rehab counselors. The counselors, the VR counselors, ensures continuation of services for the student post-graduation. So after they graduate, they're not falling for the cracks. So just to give you an example of what that might look like. Say, for example, you had a student who was high-functioning autism, who had difficulty with interpersonal communication skills and making eye contact. That's a barrier to landing a job, nailing an interview, and continuing an employment. So that student might be referred to the TSW program, be able to work on those skills while they're a high school student, identify a career path. The VR counselor, upon graduation, would take over management to ensure that that student was able to go, say, for example, to community college to continue their education. That student would then check in with the VR counselor to make sure that they're not having trouble with their classes, that their tuition is reimbursed by the state. So it's a really important program. Um, so the number of TSW staff is reflected of the number of students with disabilities who qualify for the program. And it's not an indicator of the overall quality of the school or the ability levels of the general education students who attend there or the ability levels and competence of the staff. So if you have a school that has more students with disabilities or students with a higher level or higher needs, then of course they would be assigned an additional VR counselor. Um, and I, I don't think the author was implying that special needs students quality of a school, at least I certainly hope that's not what the imp implication was with this. Uh, and I'm just going to say, I am very proud of the exceptional work Deer Valley High School has done with their TSW program and, and all of our high schools as well to ensure that our students with disabilities become not only functioning members of society, but highly successful members of society. And just to add a personal anecdote, I have a very good friend I've known for a long time. Um, our kids went to preschool together. Uh, her child was identified with a disability went through the TSW program, and that child is now working for a major health corporation. That's a real success story. Without that program, the parent said, I, I don't know what my child would be doing now. So I just want to set the record straight. If there's community members who are looking at the transition school to work program and thinking this is an indicator, how it's staffed is an indicator of the school, it's an indicator of the supports that are put into place at that school to help our students with disabilities succeed. And I would hope that everyone in the community could agree that that's a good thing. And that is my board report. Well, thank you, Ms. Frank. I can give, I can give a better than an anecdotal story. I have a son who did go through, or who is being followed by VR, and he now is uh, a junior at ASU on the dean's list and on his way to um, law school so the yes and, and he has been a guest speaker for our, our transition people so anyway um, I will talk about uh, the stand-up speak out conference that was uh, this week I attended it in a different way I was able to be a adult facilitator and the students that were in my group were from Tulsa 
um, it was as powerful as it always has been. But being able to be the facilitator, it was really neat to see that all these things that we find different about each other are the things that our kids find that they have in common. So um, uh, GCU opened their campus up. It's always a tight squeeze because there were 3,500 students, I believe 1,000 um, volunteers in whichever capacity that was. And it was, it was just nice to see it. I've not seen um, groups of kids that don't know each other meld so well as I've seen at band concerts because, or the contest, because that's what they all do. They, there's no difference, you know. So, so that was awesome. Uh, I will give a shout out to Darcy Moore from New River only because she was there for 30 years. She retired on the birthday or the anniversary of the school being open for 85 years, and she did not want me to say this out loud, so that's why I'm doing this for her. Mm -hmm. Anyway, on that note, um, another thing I just want us to always remember, we are humans, we make mistakes, we learn from mistakes, and we listen to those that we have um, maybe let down or those that we have lifted up because that's how we work um, at Deer Valley. So on that note, Dr. Finch, if you have anything. Thank you. I will keep mine short as well. I uh, Many of you went through the list of um, great activities that are happening at Deer Valley. Um, so I'll just touch on one, and that's to, that was something that happened to today, to, to, uh, in, down in the, the Capitol today. Uh, we have the North Valley Education uh, Group that is really our superintendents that are similar to us. So Peoria, P. Scottsdale, those kind of folks. And we get together and host a legislative luncheon. So we met with probably about a dozen legislators that come in and out of the room uh, talking about their different topics. So uh, just a reminder to you um, that relationships is what it's all about. So the different connections that you have, we appreciate it. So keep me in the loop if you're making connections with different legislators as we work on um, obviously the governor's um, objectives and then the legislative objectives. So um, together we make a great team because obviously you have uh, relationships maybe that I don't have. And so um, let keep me in the loop on any progress that you're making. Thanks. Oh, okay. So who's next? Oh, the futures report. The futures report. All right. Maybe I'll Wait. introduce the team as they wander up. As you know, um, the, the What's behind the futures report, going back to the beginning, was uh, the charge by the Board of Ed for to evaluate and assess where we're at from a special needs angle. And so uh, we hired a, a team from outside the district to evaluate us with hundreds of interviews and thousands of data points. And they formed a report, which we have. Um, we've done, we had a work session on it. I believe it was a marathon four hours, and they can access that if anyone wants to watch it. From that report, it's really now about the execution of that report and how to divide it into parts and probably uh, over uh, a, a, a timeline. And so there's going to be a lot of information. And um, I just want to thank the many teams that work teams that came together from staff and uh, administrators, uh, both campus and district level, to start uh, dissecting the futures report into um, to doable chunks. So these folks are going to give you a kind of a summary of where we're at and, and uh, get you up to date. Great. Um, good evening, President Ordaway, fellow members of the board, Dr. Finch. We are the first of the four teams that will speak to you tonight, and we are the Behavior Service Delivery Model Work Team. Uh, here with me, we have Mr. Kilman and Dr. McCusker, and so together, this powerful trio will give you a nice overview of what the um, work team accomplished. <laughs> So as I said, it is our pleasure to provide you with the update of our team. Uh, Dr. McCusker and I have had the privilege of co-chairing uh, this work team over the past four months. As you can see in this photo, our work team was quite large. We had representation in our membership of more than 20 folks, uh, and they represented multiple uh, stakeholder areas throughout our district. Some of these areas were central office administration, site level leadership, CESAs, the BAT team, DVEA and DVESPA, general ed teachers, special ed teachers, PARAS, RTIB, Vista Peak, preschool, psychologists, and also other members of the itinerant uh, staff. 
Dr. Cus Dr. McCusker and I would like to formally thank our team members for their hard work and dedication. Our team met three times between October and December. This work, the work required of this team extended well beyond the three meetings as well. Participants were routinely asked to perform tasks such as collecting input from their various stakeholders and also to read various research-based literature on the topics uh, that we were covering. Okay, so what exactly did our team focus on accomplishing? The Futures Report had multiple driving questions that speak to the improvement of the district's continuum of services, and those questions are the ones that our team tackled. As such, our purpose was clear. It was to address the current recommendations from the futures analysis and behavioral challenges that exist within DVUSD. Our mission was to make recommendations to refine the continuum of services in DVUSD, and our vision was to ensure that students and staff receive the behavioral supports and the training to guarantee educational success for the students and our staff. Now Mr. Kim will provide a recap of our first meeting. So as he was saying, uh, a variety of people were working on this. Um, we were given homework. So uh, before our meetings even began, we had to uh, do some deep reading of the futures report itself. So we would have a very good understanding of what um, our tasks were going to be. And then with that information, we, um, as groups, broke into smaller uh, groups within the large group and we worked to come up with um, what we felt after all the reading and the information we learned um, what would work and what was the things we needed to do so if you see up on the the board we have the number one recommendation uh, re recommendation was regionalized programs and then maybe looking at some other um, organizational things that would need to be done also to support um, so as we went through this process, we continued to have um, input and we would be looking at different uh, levels of where things needed to be. Um, and all the team members worked in different groups and we kept mixing the groups so we could get multiple inputs from them. Um, so there was a lot of information there. Um, Yeah, then, on, then at the end of every meeting, we also made sure we always had some kind of way of giving feedback. So they could take our information and other questions that we may have came up with that we didn't have time because our meetings were very structured because we had always set agendas and, and things that we needed to get done. And so like we were on time, on task, and a lot of times we had different things that we felt like we needed to give input into. So we could put these on the board and then people could, uh, when we would come back together in the next meetings, we, we could discuss those additional issues. And then um, some of the stuff that we also did is as we went back out, we had to talk to constituents, our constituents, um, people we worked with on a daily basis and, and get input from them in order to come back to the whole group and share what we had learned. So um, that way we were getting more than input than just the 20 people that were in the room. So on average, we spoke to between three to five people and we would bring that information back. And then again, we were mixed up on a consistent basis um, within the, the team to share this information. And we always reviewed the previous week and set a new goal. So every time we did this, we all understood what our task was and then we worked together to accomplish that task in each meeting. Good evening. Just, yes, just President one, Ordway. One question. When you were talking about, you brought it back to people who were you talking about employee, who, who were you, which groups were you talking about? So every, every employee group that was representative, so the speech people went and talked to the speech people, the psychologists went and talked to the psychologists, um, I talked to other special ed teachers, I also talked to gen ed teachers, um, there were general education teachers part of the team too, so <laughs> we just got, make sure we had touched base with numerous people. I even asked my principal questions. Okay, I just wanted to um, 
see who we were talking yeah about. so it, it, when you went to go get feedback you you made sure you got feedback from a variety of people because this is going to be a, a big impact to the whole school absolutely thank you i'm sorry go ahead no problem Good evening, uh, President Ordway, Governing Board members, and Dr. Finch. Uh, I apologize. I have a scratchy voice this evening. Uh, I caught the flu, so I apologize in advance if my voice gives out. Um, good evening. Um, I'm, I have the pleasure of talking about meeting number two. And meeting number two, uh, just as Harley discussed, was the team's ability to gather data and talk about the data from the constituents. And like he said, um, for example, our speech language pathologists were able to reach out to their larger speech group, um, vet any questions that the larger group had with our work team, and then bring that information back. Uh, the beauty of meeting number two is really, although we had a very large work team, as Dr. Zerbach had addressed, we really felt that we had a wide canvas of the district and representation because of the homework and the constituents input that was brought forward. Uh, once we had those discussions, we were able to break into smaller groups within uh, meeting number two, and each of the group members were able to review, um, as you can see on these chart papers, uh, they were able to review um, a high level of input or an area of target that received the most response. For example, if you look on the first chart paper, um, the groups identified based upon the research that we provided, which was vetted research through national organizations, and also input from the stakeholders um, and the constituents, that we needed to look through the lens of behavior, not based upon disability, but really what the behavior represented. So being able to provide supports and interventions for those specific behaviors. We also identified on the second chart paper um, that the data provided perspective that our younger students were the ones that were struggling the most with behavior uh, district-wide. And so really looking through a K-3 lens. And then finally on the third chart paper, again looking through the lens of um, behavioral need versus disability and really focusing on more severe behaviors. Um, are you considering behaviors for gen ed students as well, or just special education? Thank you, Ms. Tweedy, for the question. Um, at this time, we are focusing on special education. However, uh, the beauty of our work team is that our work is not yet done. And so I believe through our work and also our collaboration outside of our work team, um, the incidental benefit will trickle down to our gen ed um, colleagues and peers. Um, being able to establish uh, supports for behavior for the district, I believe we'll be able to expand to support other areas in the district. So we're starting small so we can ensure that we're able to replicate this in other venues. Okay. Um, the next slide talks about the overall questions, the guiding questions uh, that we lodged within our work team. And so when we talked about the regionalization of programs, really what did this mean? We had to look at all of these different criteria to assure that we answered all of the questions. For example, which students would be impacted? which staff would be impacted, and so forth. So we really dove into the data, and we asked those questions not only of the work team, but also for them to solicit um, information from their constituents. And in order to develop a comprehensive system of support for behavior in Deer Valley Unified School District, we really wanted uh, the stakeholder input and being able to expand upon this, as Ms. Tweedy had just identified, uh, to support all students. The next slide is another um, example of how we garnered and valued input from our team members. Um, Dr. Zerbach's leadership during this was wonderful because we were at a very fast pace. We had a lot of work to do and the magnitude of the work could have been foreseen as we're not going to be able to get this done. Uh, but we were able to move forward um, in three very heavy sessions with what we feel are very valued and beneficial recommendations. 
Um, and as we gathered that input, each time, as Harley, Mr. Kilman has referred to, we were able to reference with our work team what we did well, what we could improve on, and any other areas um, that we could gather information from. These are more examples um, of our work teams uh, deliberating and gathering data. You can see Mr. Kilman there in the bottom picture, the star of the show. And then moving on to meeting number three. Uh, meeting number three, uh, we continue to dig into the priorities from meeting number two. So it was a further dig into the data that we had already discussed. We also started to be more strategic about our discussions and determining possibly the number of intervention programs for behavior that we would consider for the district. And we looked through the lens of intervention on this because truly we felt as a work team, if we could capitalize with our younger students and provide intervention, this would be more beneficial to our younger students. Um, we have reviewed additional research that again was vetted through national uh, sources and that was homework for our work team members. And we worked together to create a timeline for next steps as we continue um, on this scope through the futures analysis. And we also created a communication plan. The communication plan really focused on what our elevator speech would be if someone in our district came up to us and said, what's the work team doing for behavior service delivery? And so we all um, worked together to formulate our elevator speeches. <clears throat> Okay, so as far as the final recommendations from this uh, particular team, we wanted to note that as you have seen in the prior slides that all members of the team recognize that the work uh, that needs to be done will require support from the central office and specifically student support services. However, as it is currently staff, it is unlikely that student support services would be able to provide the level of support that will be needed in order for the programming to be as successful as we would like it. The team was cognizant that this recommendation perhaps would not be um, popular with some, but they did recognize that it would be necessary in order for the long-term success of our students and our staff. So some of these uh, support personnel that the group is recommending for student support services would help with the oversight of some of this additional program that we're talking about. Uh, the team also recommended that due to the focus on the early elementary grades that early childhood would move under student support services in the 2020-2021 school year. We also wanted to note that Vista Peak 2 would have a role in this as we look to maximize our district's capacity uh, to help our students and our uh, staff with high intensity behavioral needs. Finally, it is important, and to Ms. Tweedy's point that she um, brought up earlier, to note that much of what we have described here is targeted for students without disabilities, or with disabilities. While this is a positive step forward, we mustn't forget that our students without disabilities are struggling with behaviors too. As such, the team has recommendations for potential expansion of BAT, also, that the regional programming that would perhaps happen within one of our regions would become a lab type environment where folks from around the district could come, whether they had students with disabilities or not, and learn some of the strategies and techniques that are being used in that environment and then transfer those over to their own classrooms. Also, we want to recognize uh, that our collaboration with the SEL team, our social emotional will be critical with this is that too um, will help all students um, in our schools. And then finally, as Dr. McCusker noted, that this is the start and we anticipate more work in this area. Mrs. Frank or Ms. Frank. So how do you um, envision expanding the programming at Vista Peak? What does that look like? What types of programs and, and what is the capacity there? Thank you for the question, Vice President Frank. Um, we are currently reviewing data. Um, as the governing board knows, uh, we do privately place students at Vista Peak as well as up 
private locations uh, throughout the valley. And so really looking at the capabilities of Vista Peak and the wonderful work that they do with students, um, I have a great interest and belief um, in the system that is currently there and being able to bring programs back to the district and being able to support our district students in the district is a hope that the work team also discussed. And so um, we are looking at the data um, and the data is a powerful resource for us to make a more defined decision. Uh, we have started discussions and collaboration on this and certainly um, as we move forward, we will keep the governing board apprised. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Uh, President Ordway, member of the board, Dr. Finch, I too oh, we might have a bit of a sore throat. So I'm going to chat with you a little bit about the second work team, and that was the academic focus work team. And this work team actually had three topic areas that we were addressing with the, the team members that were a part of it. That was co-teaching, MTSS, multi-tier systems of support, and transitions. As you can see, this was co-chaired by four of us, uh, Ms. Shona Miranda, Dr. Scott Smith, and Dr. Tunis. Each of us had a role, and each of us took an individual topic um, to um, kind of work with a group of teachers. We were very fortunate to have a, a larger group of teachers that represented preschool, elementary, middle, high school teachers and administrators, including um, TSW uh, mm -hmm. administration, as well as our <coughs> PLC manager. So um, their combined expertise and knowledge not only uh, currently but historically helped those conversations. We too had three meetings as well last fall. In the first meeting, where all three groups met together, when we broke off, what we really wanted to do was ground the team members in that futures report. So we took time to have everybody look at the specific areas, and you can see the page numbers from the report, that we had our, our team members read and, and really think through. And then we had a task that had them um, kind of share or summarize their understanding of what the futures uh, recommendations were for those three areas, co-teaching, MTSS, and, and transition. Uh, this meeting led to some homework between this one and the second meeting. And that homework really had them, again, diving deeper into what is co-teaching and also what's the history of co-teaching in Deer Valley. We also looked at transition and what does it mean. So we, we, we heard from um, Vice President Frank about the TSW program, but we have transition from preschool to kindergarten, kindergarten into first grade, uh, sixth grade into middle school, eighth grade into high school. So we're looking at the full continuum of transitions for children in Deer Valley. And then the last area we were really focusing on in that report was MTSS, multi-tier systems of support. And some of the things that the Futures Report talked to us about is it seemed across our campuses that there may not be a complete understanding of MTSS perhaps as compared to RTI and a, a, a misunderstanding of those two terms. So we had them work on homework readings and um, had a discussion board and had them share not only their understandings but their historical perspective in those three areas. Our second meeting and these were brave souls because that second meeting ended up being on a Friday at four o'clock and they, they still showed up for us. What we did is um, Dr. Smith had pulled together each of the recommendations and broke them out into those three areas. The team had a consensogram and we used um, uh, dots and identified in each of those areas for, let's say there were five in um, co-teaching. Which one did we feel was most important or it needed immediate attention? Which did we feel needed short-term attention? So a little bit further out and then long-term attention. It could wait for a while. We did that in all three areas, co-teaching, MTSS, and um, transitions. And then once that was done, um, we self-selected into those three groups. So we had a, a pretty good self-selection. Each group had a, a good uh, mix of teachers and educators and others, and they took the consensogram information and then rank, ranked them into, okay, these are the immediate things, so this is what we're going to do spring of 2020 if it goes through, summer, 
fall and put action steps together as well as who would be responsible and if there were budgetary implications or implications for um, any of the other teams like behavior or human resources. And you can see these are the consensograms for those three areas. And then there are questions written um, and, and things that we did just to help build, again, greater understanding. The third meeting when we came together in December was to, to take those recommendations. And Dr. Smith, again, had compiled um, all of those areas. And so we worked in pairs this time and made determinations on rank order of what was most important to go into immediate, what was most important into short term and long term. From there, you um, have received from all of us, but from this group, the um, proposed plan and timeline. And so you may have, have seen this in the update. Um, so we broke those three areas. And if you look in the front, you can see T is for transition, M is for MTSS, and then the, the actual action step, the responsible persons, and then the rank ordering um, that those particular folks in those teams felt was the most important to tackle immediately. So this is spring, and you can see it, that's right now. And then summer was fairly, fairly short. We moved into fall of 2020. Uh, again, all three of those areas having action steps built in. Spring of 2021, a year from now. And then um, a little further out, so there's less because when we're a little further out, I'm not quite sure how things will but 21, 22, 22, 23, and then 23, 24. And so this work team said if we were to, if there was only us to think about, this is what we would want you to think about for MTSS co-teaching and transition. So with that, uh, if you have any questions, if not, I'll turn it over to Mr. Scott Warner. Good evening. Since it's my turn, uh, I think we're about halfway through. So, um, And I don't have any uh, scratchy throats, so I think we'll go through this. Um, social emotional learning work team, we were the least... Uh, mentioned in the futures report, if you read the futures report, um, it really was basically you're kind of doing it now and you ought to keep doing it, I think is what it boiled down to. So uh, when we um, we met as a group, we were about 10 people. Um, I was a, the, the chairperson. We represented uh, a lot of true believers when it came to SEL in the district, uh, counselors, social workers, uh, a couple principals, um, folks like that. So we really had a, excellent discussions about social and emotional learning uh, from that perspective. So here's our three meetings. Um, we spent the first meeting talking about our group interaction, how the, what the guidelines would be. Uh, we discussed our connection to the futures report, how we really were sort of the general education part of the futures report. Uh, we, we saw that uh, as a, a significant piece for us. Um, and uh, we really had a, a lively discussion about SEL in, in the Deer Valley Unified School District. Um, I brought to them a, uh, a list of the SEL programs that our schools self-identify as running. Um, and there, there's, a, there's a great variety of programs in our district that we discovered. So um, in our second meeting, we got together and really discussed how we would want to assess and evaluate SEL in our district. And, and we've been before you before, and we've talked to you about the CASEL rubric. We like that rubric very much, um, and we think that we want to start using that assessment tool uh, right away. Uh, we did have a good conversation, and we think that it's going to be an important use of our counseling guidelines uh, at the high school level. We think that the high school level versus the rest of our, our district, that it's kind of different animals sometimes when it comes to SEL. So we really want to make sure that we are evaluating, assessing our high schools as effectively as we can. And then our last meeting, um, we actually wanted to stay together as a work team, um, at least to the end of the year, if not through the end of next year. Uh, it's a group of people really dedicated to trying to figure out what's best for our district. So really the first uh, thing that we're going to start doing is we're going to assess where we're at with SEL as a district and at our sites um, this year. We expect to do that assessment for, before the end of the year. Uh, next year, we really hope to uh, winnow down the number of SEL programs that our district offers so we're to, to create a menu for our school so that uh, any person walking onto a campus knows what the SEL program is and knows what that's supposed to look like and how that uh, they're supposed to interact. Um, something like five to eight uh, SEL programs that are research-based. So that would be sort of our, our plan next year to take a look at the, the school's um, 
that are currently involved with uh, robust SEO programs uh, and see what other programs might exist for us. And then really the third year would be helping schools who don't currently have a robust SEO program uh, start to develop um, that kind of program for their, uh, for their school site. And that was, uh, well, that's where we're at, so. Okay, and before we get to our last two slides, I want to let the, bar, uh, let the board know that there is a fourth work team, and that work team is the human capital team chaired by Mrs. Moffitt. That work team um, is not presenting tonight because much of their work is dependent on the work of the other teams. And so once the other teams with their short, immediate, and long-term uh, implementation plans become in effect, then that uh, team will also help support uh, those teams with their implementation. So this past Friday in the update, you received the combined timeline with all three work groups. And the way you, you took a look at that is spring of 2020, all of the academics, and, and you saw that from us, all of the behavior, and then all of the SEL. And the timeline runs through 23-24. Um, now we know that um, that can be a little overwhelming. What we wanted to do, though, is two weeks ago we pulled all three teams together to um, kind of come to some closure, but also to share the work of the three work teams as well as so solicit input from the team members that weren't part of each of our own. And so it was a wonderful time to get together, not only to celebrate the work that each team had done, but also then for them to ask questions and give the facilitators um, some, some things to think about and consider throughout that plan and that timeline. Um, once that was done, each of the, all of us, created an elevator speech because what we want to do is each of those people are, are the people who created the action steps and the timelines that you have seen. It is the combined work of our certified, our classified, our admin, and our central office folks who have put this, this plan together and a timeline um, for um, the recommendations from the Futures Report. Now we know we know that um, there's a lot of work, and you you saw that. So more than likely, based on the feedback from those teams, and just looking at the scope of work, um, we talked about this in cabinet. Instead of um, thinking about all of them at one time, thinking about them in a thematic way. So potentially starting with the behavior work team's recommendations this spring and moving forward with those. And then um, starting with um, MTSS in the fall. And, and the reason we would say MTSS is MTSS and PLCs, they go hand in hand um, because the MTSS looks at all four questions, but specifically looks at questions three and four. What will we do if they don't get it? And what we do if they've already um, learned it? So that would be maybe a theme that we would start in the fall and continue from there. And then um, transition a year from now and those recommendations beginning then and moving forward. And then um, in the 21-22 school year, perhaps look at the co-teaching recommendations and work through those. As you heard from Scott, SEL is pretty solid in the work that they're doing. We are in process and moving, so they would be flowing all the way through right now. But when we looked at the combined timeline, we said, okay, that, that's, a, that's, that's, great, that's great work, but we can't do it all, mainly because whatever we do with those action steps, we want to do with fidelity, we want to do it well, and we want to make sure that we have planned for any budgetary implications that any of those action steps might require. So what you may see um, within the next few weeks or month will be that timeline changed um, so that it does reflect um, a different way of looking at the recommendations from each of those groups. Thank you. So I, I have a question about the, the co-teaching model. I, I know Deer Valley um, over the years has done a number of co-teaching trainings. I think I did a co-teaching training, what, about 
10 years ago when I was still a teacher here. Um, and it was a great training. My only disappointment was there was no one for me to ever co-teach with. So I'm just wondering, as we're training people, um, are we collecting data to look and see if they're actually able to utilize the training at that school? Or is that something that you would consider going forward? Um, I always felt really sad and lonely. There was no co-teacher <laughs> for me. <laughs> Ms. Frank. Uh, I will say that the teachers who are part of the academic focus work team were very excited about the potential um, future for co-teaching. We know that there would be a lot of work that would need to go into it. First, defining what co-teaching is. There are various models for co-teaching and determining which one or ones would fit at every level. There are budgetary implications with co-teaching simply because um, you need to have the special education staff members so that they can have a gen ed teacher that they can co-teach with, be partners with, and they're not pulled throughout the day um, to go to another place. So there are, there are some budgetary implications there. But I will say, um, if and when we are moving forward with those, we will be very strategic um, because, just as you said, the teachers who remember our initial foray into co-teaching were very excited and really wanted that as a strategy to support both gen ed and special ed kids. And I'd also like to thank everyone for their hard work and also say I'm extremely grateful. You're all down there and I'm up here. And Mr. Warner, you don't have a sore throat yet. <laughs> oh, but you're I hope you're all listening. feeling better soon. Um, I, I do have a question. So with... Uh, whatever the timeline is that that you'll decide to go forward with are we sharing that with a budget committee how are we going to make room for those changes if if those changes are to be implemented um president ordway uh, the reason uh, as um dr zerbach mentioned uh, jenna is not up here giving a report is because um, she is going to wait to see, along with Jim and Miss Moffat, um, where where that timeline begins, and then um, backwards planning each year to what would be those budgetary implications. I'd have to turn it over to Jim, um, but you all are really the first that are are looking at this combined timeline and hearing that we may chunk it a little differently than than combining everything and throwing everything up um, each each time period. So I'll, I'll throw Jim under the bus just a little bit. But no, we, we don't throw people under buses. We have very safe bus drivers. So go ahead, Jim. <laughs> hey, Jim. <laughs> oh, sorry. Uh, President Orway, members it. of the board. Uh, yes. Uh, so we have uh, parallel tracks working right now in terms of budget development for uh, fiscal year 21. Uh, and so there have been ongoing discussions about um, not only the futures or a, um, the, the work teams that are related to the futures report and how they may um, have budgetary implications for, for next year, uh, but we're also seeking input from our community members and working through our employee groups as we do uh, every year. Uh, we don't do the futures uh, work teams every yes, year, but don't. the other processes uh, we certainly do, um, and 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 uh, uh, I agree that uh, you can see uh, there's been ongoing communication at the district office uh, level about what some of those, what of these things are, can they practically um, apply, and when you know because uh, uh, there might take a little bit more time for planning for some of the uh, recommendations that are come out of these work teams. Yeah, I just wanted to make sure that we were. I'm sure we are, but I wanted to say, to hear you say that we're um, working together with that so we have room when we need to grow. Anybody else? No. Well, do you guys have anything else? Nothing? All right, thank you. All right, where are we? Oh, we are at public comments. We are at public comments. Okay, okay so we are at the uh, public comments section. Before I read the admonishment, uh, required admonishment, I would just like to thank personally thank all of our speakers who came to speak to us tonight for sitting through a very lengthy report. So thank you for your patience as we worked through that uh, governing board business. So um, 
I'll call the first name uh, and read the admonishment as you make your way to the microphone. Jillian Jones. Okay. So the board invites public comment on the district's business in general and on any agenda item in specific. Speakers are limited to three minutes. To accommodate all speakers within the 30 minute overall limit, the board president may shorten speakers' times. Vulgarity, disruptive conduct, or remarks disrespecting employees by name will not be allowed. The governing board cannot discuss or act on any items not listed on the agenda. Board members may respond to criticism, ask staff to review a matter, or request a future agenda item. If you could please state your name into the microphone, please. Jillian Jones. Thank you. Thank you, board members, for your time today. I am the parent of two students in the district. I am also a community organizer for parents of special needs students. Many of us who are affected by the boundary changes have applied for open enrollment so that our kids can continue attending their current school. And many of us have recently been contacted by the district informing us that our kids have been waitlisted until, until it can be determined if the school has adequate special needs resources. Meanwhile, open enrollment requests from general ed students who applied after we did are being approved. While I understand that the district is trying to be prudent in making sure each school has adequate SPED resources for its students, this practice is not only unfair, it is against state law. ARS 15-816.01 states that school districts must develop policies regarding open enrollment and that those policies shall be posted on the district website. DVS, uh, DVS, <laughs> DVUSD's website states that open enrollment requests will be evaluated based on school and grade level availability and further states that requests are granted in the order that applications are received. Nothing is mentioned about a separate or secondary review process for students on IEPs requiring special education services. The initial co communication parents receive doesn't even explain why their child is being waitlisted and only after calling the school in the district is it explained. Furthermore, nothing was mentioned about this in the community meetings that were held to discuss boundary changes. We're not talking about a couple of families who decided to move. We're talking about thousands of special needs students and their families potentially being displaced through no action of their own. When Peoria School District changed its boundaries a few years ago, special ed students were grandfathered into their current school. This is because it is vital to students with special needs to have a consistent learning environment. Speaking from experience with my son who has severe dyslexia and struggles on a daily basis, school is hard enough for these kids. But having to change schools and get used to a whole new campus with all new students and an entirely different team of teachers and resource specialists would not only be tremendously stressful, it would be detrimental to their educational progress. I implore you to not only be more transparent in your open enrollment policies, I also urge you to consider the needs of your special education students and find a way to allow them to continue attending their current school. <coughs> Our children may be square pegs that don't fit perfectly into the round holes of the public education system, but they contribute to the diversity of the school community and above all, they should be afforded opportunities as children. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Finch, I would like uh, information on uh, the specific case provided to the board. Well, to uh, that point, um, Ms. <coughs> you requested that as a discussion item, right? And so I would second Ms. Reed's request. And I would third it. Rachel Sodegren, and I hope I pronounced your name correctly. You've got to state your name, Rachel. Can I go? Oh, oh sorry. Oh, yeah, go ahead. Please state your name into the microphone. Rachel Sodegren. My son has special needs and has attended the same school in the district for five years. All of those five years, we have been within the boundary for his home school. With the new boundary changes, his home school will change, and we would like to keep him at his current school, where he is familiar with the IEP team, where he's also in, gifted, in the gifted program and the IB program, both to which he's also become accustomed to. Um, as Jillian stated, DVUSD's open enrollment policy states applicants will be notified of their acceptance or denial depending on the school capacity 
in the order the applications are received. This made us all believe that students or that all students would be given the same opportunity to attend their school of choice. We applied for open enrollment in November and recently received a response that the request was not accepted and he has been waitlisted. I was surprised as other students were being approved even when they applied later than we did. The district told me the reason he was waitlisted is because he has an IEP. Hmm. Um, I did also hear that if there is capacity in the special ed program at his current school, there's a possibility he'll be accepted later on, but it's a much more complicated process with more steps to go through. My main concern is DVUSD's open enrollment policy does not inform parents that children with an IEP will go through a different process to be considered for open enrollment. Neither the open enrollment section nor special education section on the website provide information on this longer, more complicated process. I did email the board about a week and a half ago asking what this process entails and have not received a response, so I was glad to hear Mrs. Reed touch on it earlier and that it will be discussed. Uh, the policy should be clear that IEP students will automatically be waitlisted and may have to wait shortly before the school year for a final decision. To be clear, I'm not asking that my child be given an advantage over any other child. I'm simply asking for him to have the same opportunity as other children. With disorders such as ADHD and OCD, stability and consistency are key to my son's educational success. Also, in general, twice exceptional children have a more difficult time making social connections, and now with him being in middle school, which is a precarious time for social development, he may be forced to go to a different school than the friends he has known for years, all because he has disabilities. For reference, the state law regarding open enrollment um, says these policies shall include admission criteria, application procedures, and transportation provisions. The district's open enrollment policy does not advise parents of the actual admission criteria being used, nor does it state there is a different and more complicated process for students with Even if my child does not continue attending his current school, I hope the board will make the open enrollment policy more clear and comprehensive going forward so the information provided can be valuable to all parents, not just those whose children do not have a disability. Thank you for your time. I will call the next three speakers together, Dr. Leslie Salsby, Margaret Salsby, and Levi Salsby. So if you would uh, make your way to the microphone. And, and please state your name into the microphone for the record. I'm Margaret Salsby. Oh, that's loud. Um, good evening. I'm, Mar I'm Margaret Salsby. I'm the mother of Levi whose complaint about the Escape the Plantation game at Highland Lakes Renaissance and the teacher's handling of that game and complaint were a, of a DVUSD um, investigation. I will tell you, my husband and I met with Dr. Finch this morning about our experience so far, and I don't know if our meeting today will lead to any changes in the district's conclusions or actions, um, but we finally feel like we've been heard. The district's conclusion was that the teachers involved were not trying to be racist. The teachers are still in the classroom and we don't know what, if any, disciplinary actions they have faced. We're hoping that Levi can return to school soon. I'm a white woman and I think there's a lot of us here tonight. I can tell you that as the wife of a black man and the mother of two biracial children, I've learned a lot about myself and my community in the past month and a half. I grew up in a community where I was a minority, but I was always acutely aware of the advantages I had as a white girl. And I can speak for many of us here, whether we know it or not, we are all inherently privileged by the color of our skin. My husband and my children well, first of all, those of us who are privileged by that, we can all tell each other and tell ourselves that we are colorblind. My husband and my child are not because they are acutely aware every day of the color of their skin. And incidents like what happened at Highland Lakes reminds them of that every day. I have a lot more here, but I don't have time. Um, I don't know that I can adequately convey to everybody here how deeply this incident has hurt our family. It's made us question every 
interaction we've had at the school and wonder if any discipline issues we've ever had are related to the color of his skin. I hope you can see why we have had some hesitation in taking our son back to school and into that classroom. But as we heard earlier from other students, how great the Renaissance program is, that is why we're so passionate about getting him back in that classroom. So we just want him to be in a safe and supportive educational environment. We don't want him to be the one punished. Right now, he's the one who has to have a modified schedule. He's the one who has to either move classes, move school, go somewhere else because of what he was subjected to. I don't know how or why the district has put their HR processes above the welfare and education of my son, but I'm hoping eventually that can change. I'm hoping he can be where he belongs. I'm hoping that we can all do better. Thank you, Dr. Salsby. All right, thank you. I'm Leslie Salsby. I'm Levi's father and Margaret's husband. And frankly, I can't really say it better than she did. Um, but I will say a couple things. The one thing we've asked for throughout this entire situation is for my son to be able to go to school without being taught by racists. I asked that last week and I was told, I'm gonna to bring my son to school and the answer I got was, you're gonna be disappointed. I was said today, I made a comment today, we were talking about the, the pervasive racism I think exists in the district and Dr. Finch said, well, you know, we have 4,000 employees, they can't all be racist. But then why isn't anybody upset? Why are we the only ones upset? Why isn't the entire school upset? Why aren't you upset? Why aren't you all upset? Why isn't everybody upset? You know, racism, if this was abuse or neglect or something like that in the classroom, if a teacher yelled and cussed at him, I was told I made this point today and it was told, would that be different? It's not different. Racism is not different. Racism is exactly that. Maybe it's different from you and that's the privilege my wife spoke of, but it's not different for us. Maybe it'd be different for you if it was something that would affect your kid, but seeing as racism can't affect most people in this room, maybe it's not different, I don't know. But that's how we feel today. And that's sad. That's really, really sad that we feel that way because my son earned his way into a highly gifted program that he has been in one day since December 19th, one day. And the only thing we've asked is that he go to school without racists and it has taken a month to figure that out and we still haven't got an answer of okay yet i'm being told that the district is full of non-racists so if that were so then why can't we find a couple to teach my son the last thing i like to end with i'd like to acknowledge my son my son levi my son's a hero he's my hero he's the only person who had the integrity and the courage to stand up and stand here right now in front of you he's 10 years old he doesn't deserve to play a game called Escape the Plantation. He doesn't deserve to be admonished for it in front of his classmates. He doesn't deserve to have to come home and question every day, why is he at home and the teachers are still in the classroom? What did he do wrong? What we were offered was restorative justice. That's, a, that, that's for disciplinary issues. What did he do wrong? Nobody can answer that question. Nobody's apologized for racism. Nobody has yet to say, this was racist, this was wrong, we don't stand for this. What we get is, but, 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 you should, but, 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 please let us explain. I get it. You apologize that me and my family is upset. You apologize that we're hurt and you apologize that we're frustrated. I would like somebody to apologize that it was done. Apologize that we have racist teachers. Apologize that it happened. Apologize, like I said two weeks ago, standing right here. Apologize for being offensive, not for us being offended. It's a very different thing. Racism is not something you can apologize and it goes away. This is not a mistake. This is not an incorrect move in pedagogy. This is not where the teachers zigged where they should have zagged. This is institutional. It is deliberate. It is mean and it is cruel. And from everybody in here, I've been told that that is not what we as a district stand for. So please, please make my son whole. Want to say anything? Okay. He doesn't want to say anything. Thank you for your time. Okay. Thank you. 
Okay. Dr. Finch, if you would provide the board with an update and sure. information on yep. this, be appreciated. Thank you. I actually think we're going um, to have an executive session on it uh, next time we're together at the February board meeting. Bring our attorneys in and give you an update. Well, yeah, obviously we can't discuss Correct. matters in public due to privacy for Correct. both the family and... Yep, you'll get yeah. um, an update um, of the progress that we're making in a Friday update before that as well. Okay, thank you. And as you, as the parents uh, talked about this morning, that we met this morning, and I'll okay. update you on that progress we're making. Okay, this thank you. Three. Dr. Finch, if you could take a minute and just explain when when we get our lawyers involved that that we have to let our lawyers talk that we can't I, I've gotten I've gotten questions from parents as to why why we're not responding so can you just take a second and explain that sure. please? that um, with any any uh, issue in the district um, as a board member you can use um, outside counsel to give you wisdom to give you uh, perspective but obviously with FERPA rights and, and student rights and staff rights, um, there's a line that uh, board members uh, can come up to. So that's why we use counsel in different situations. So uh, next time we get together, um, it might be wise to get their perspective. So that's the reason why we bring them in. But in general, I don't respond from the dais to issue, issues involving families in, because of um, it, uh, FERPA privacy issues. So. But um, we do appreciate it when they come and, and, and keep the board informed. And other, in addition to that, we're, we're not allowed to because it's not agendized. So, um, Pardon me? right, it's not agendized, so it's illegal for us to talk about anything in specific. It is not um, against the law for us to listen and respond um, with the help that you're going to give us with being in a spot where we can hear everything that had gone on. So um, with that, let's go to old business 5A. Item 5A. Item 5A, I move that the governing board accept the administration's recommendation to approve to change the high school boundaries, including the development of the transitional plan per the attached presentation. Second. Is there any further discussion? I have a question. That would be further discussion. Yes, please. Okay. Okay. Um, so I, I have a couple of questions. I know we had a study session on this um, last week. We've talked about it quite a bit, and I, I do appreciate the additional information that was sent uh, following the study session. Um, there was, um, in lieu of a written report from Dr. Brown, uh, some information from an email from Dr. Brown. Um, and there were some uh, statements or bullet points that, Ms. Regluna, you looked a, l a little puzzled as to, I, I mean, I don't, I'm not trying to catch anybody off guard, uh, but there was an email received from Dr. Skip Brown with the statement um, that Barry Goldwater will exceed SFB capacity uh, no matter what in five years, and that Boulder Creek and Deer Valley will never exceed SFB capacity. So. Uh, my question is, why aren't we doing more with those boundaries to balance the enrollment? I'm concerned that um, the recommendation, as it stands now, isn't going to completely balance all of our high school enrollment and kind of solve that problem going forward. And, and I apologize if... Um, I think this was sent from Dr. Finch, that it had come from Mr. Miglarino. Well, somebody sent yeah, the it email. Doesn't, <laughs> ring, doesn't ring a bell for me, but um, I I printed it off. So okay, maybe Miss Taylor said, shared it with us. Okay, maybe. And and um, the I see the question as does does this completely solve the problem of the future? And I think um, in our study session we talked a lot about um, the value of a magic eight ball, but actually. It just guides us uh, out there a little ways. And I think this information is, um, we are just guessing. We are making educated 
guess is into the future. And that's kind of what uh, Dr. Uh, Skip Brown is talking about is this is our best guess into the future. So um, we don't have the magic ball that tells us exactly what to do, but using uh, the demographer's um, wisdom and his and uh, Rick's um, numbers, putting those two together with our knowledge of the um, system and the fact that obviously Deer Valley is landlocked, um, we are now working on a solution that will help us down the road help us uh, put off the um, having to build a, another high school in the immediate future. So that's kind of the, the point he's trying to make there. I think maybe Mr. M could fill in any cracks what, that I might've missed. Um, go ahead. Uh, President Ordway, uh, Ms. Frank, the, uh, I think the email that you're referencing was um, prior to the study session. Mm -hmm. Um, that we uh, had, I think it was dated the 20th. I was That's what I was trying to recall when you were yeah. um, mentioning it. Uh, so I, I looked it up uh, while I was listening to you. Um, and uh, as we mentioned uh, during the study session, uh, it's, it's extremely difficult to, to calculate the capacity of a high school um, because the number of students uh, that are enrolled in a high school can actually be a little bit misleading because they might be enrolled uh, in that high school for one section in a classroom at the school itself um, because they could be taking an online cat class, a CTE class. Um, and so uh, we were charged with the, the task of asking the high school principals what the actual capacity would be. And that's the information that we provided to the board um, after the, the study session. That information was not provided to Dr. Brown prior to his email dated on the 20th. Um, and so he was, uh, if you read his email in its entirety, he says, if we do nothing, um, the situation is worse. So we improve the situation, but uh, we are using projections. Um, and so there's no guarantee that it will be exactly as we project it to be, but it will improve the situation. It will significantly improve the situation. So um, given uh, the capacity at the affected schools, will we be able to honor the transition plan that we have, uh, will be promising residents that their students can be grandfathered into Mountain Ridge or O'Connor, whatever the high school is they're being displaced from, that uh, there will be room for, for those students through open enrollment? Will we be able to honor that plan? Will there be capacity for students? Uh, I'm given, not sure if your question is in perpetuity. I mean, because I well, think that some of the some of the concerns that have been raised are not just uh, the eighth grade students or siblings of any uh, other students that are currently attending, but it's for younger uh, students that their boundary, their high school boundary, would be changing. Um, and I don't think that we can guarantee that anybody in a changed boundary that's not either an eighth grade student today or currently attending their school. I don't know that we can. Um, can guarantee that those students would be able to attend the school of their choice. But we are saying that any eighth grader or any student currently attending those schools or any siblings of those students, um, that they would be able to attend. So we're giving them priority status during the open enrollment process. So, so we can honor that transition plan, say, four to five years out from now. Is that no, I'm, if they're an I'm, eighth grader going next year to... Mountain Ridge or O'Connor, they would be in school for four years, so we would be able to accommodate them through at least the next four years. Yeah, President Orway, Ms. Frank, if that's your definition of four to five years, yes. I, I, I just would want to make it clear that we're not saying for the next four or five years that we can honor any student in a changed boundary that would want to go to the school that they previously were assigned, assuming the boundary changes uh, this evening. We, we would be able to, once, once they're at the school, um, we roll them up into the in, into the counts, so um, that that's pretty straightforward. It's the siblings of all those students that would be eighth graders currently this year, or anybody currently attending the school, uh, so that we can honor that guiding principle of keeping families together. Um, that that we I think we can honor with the capacity that was provided by the principals. Uh, but any student younger than a current eighth grader. Uh, or that is not a sibling of somebody currently attending, I don't know that we can assure them 
that they would get in. I also would go so far to say that I wouldn't discount the possibility that they could attend the school of their choice. It would be on open enrollment and it would be based on the capacity of the school. Okay, I just want to make sure if we're saying, okay, we're grandfathering those eighth graders in, that, that is a commitment that we can keep to those families. Yeah, you are correct. Those are. Just tweeting. Go ahead. Well, well back to the um, email that Ms. Frank's referring to. I don't have it in front of me, but I believe he said, um, he said that if we change the boundaries the way that they're proposed to be changed, that Barry Goldwater will exceed capacity Mountain Ridge will exceed capacity. And then he said um, Sandra Day and Boulder Creek will not exceed capacity. So if that's the case, why didn't we zone Barry Goldwater different to Sandra Day into Boulder Creek so we wouldn't have to build a new school? Because um, if those two aren't exceeding capacity, like for example, we just zoned the brand new school being built to Barry Goldwater knowing it was going to exceed capacity when our expert said Sandra Day and Boulder Creek wouldn't. It just seems like we're setting ourselves up to have to build a new school. My argument, um, or my thoughts, I, don't interrupt the board meeting. I, um, I think Jim... The, Jim, are you writing down to answer her? Yeah, I can answer it too as well. Um, we are talking about um, projections in five years from now. So um, many things will happen until then. It is our goal to improve that scenario through the boundary changes. So therefore, in three years from now, that data will even be more accurate. And five years from now, it'll be then we'll be approaching the communities um, if we feel that that's the right time to uh, think about a new high school. It's very possible we will not. So um, we believe that this plan will even out our um, students at the high school level so that we um, will have a better chance of avoiding that in five years. But we won't know until those five years come this way. But the boundary expert said that um, the two schools right by Barry Goldwater were not exceeding capacity and then we zoned Correct. a brand new school to the school that is exceeding capacity. That doesn't make any sense. Like, it seems like we had an opportunity to fix this. And, and the boundary the boundary expert, in his own words, said we didn't fix the problem. We changed it by three years, but we could have fixed it when you look at the enrollment. Mr. Megalorino. Um, President Ordway, uh, Ms. Tweedy, I'm sorry. I was just trying to make sure I got some of the facts correct. So, um, Dr. Brown was using a different capacity. So let's just take for granted uh, Mountain Ridge High School. Uh, he was using a capacity of uh, 2,576 students. And per the principal's determination, um, they're saying that there's uh, 2,700 students that could attend Mountain Ridge High School. Uh, so in that scenario, uh, in the proposed um, boundary change, in the 22-23 year, there'd be 2,717 students, so just over, um, and you know, a couple of years out. Uh, and then uh, for, for the, the subsequent three years, we're just over the 2,700 students in the projection, and it dips down in the 25-26 year to under 2,700. So he was using a lower capacity to make that determination that was in his email because we had not asked the principals for their input. Uh, so, again, what was stated uh, at the study session uh, happened to be the school facilities board capacity, which is a stated capacity that's based on total square footage or gross square footage <laughs> divided by a factor. Uh, it doesn't take into consideration um, how many classrooms there are, how big the parking lot is. Uh, and, and so the high school principals were kind enough to be able to offer their insight because they're the ones that determine whether or not an open enrollment is deemed to be uh, over their capacity to be able to accept it, what we refer to as going on a wait list. So he, the, Dr. Brown was using a lower capacity that's stated by the school facilities board. Our school principals who make the determination of whether or not an open enrollment would be accepted uh, indicate that they can have more students than the school facilities board standard. What, what were the five 
numbers that they gave you, respective of the five high schools? Um, so Barry Goldwater High School was 2,400 students. Mm -hmm. Boulder Creek High School was 2,800 students. Deer Valley High School, 2,400 students. And both Mountain Ridge and Sandra Day O'Connor uh, were at 2,700 students. I Mrs. O'Brien. Mr. Maglarino, isn't the other factor in the um, Barry Goldwater capacity and the Sandra Day O'Connor capacity is that based on current student open enrollment trends, um, students who are currently uh, they're within the boundaries of Barry Goldwater, there is a percentage of those going over to Sandra Day O'Connor. So open enrollment, um, i.e. school choice, is helping to, w would continue, if the trends keep going, would help to balance out those numbers. Is, is that not correct? Is that not what we saw in some of our original numbers? Uh, President Orway, uh, Ms. O'Brien, uh, yes, it's it's correct to, stay, to state that the projections are based on uh, where um, we would project students based on the historical trend. Um, but I will also, uh, I should also comment that um, the historical trends will likely change whenever we see a high school boundary. So uh, a, high, a high school boundary change. Uh, so what um, it, it is fair to say that where you have a large propensity of students that are choosing one school over another um, and the boundary now includes them you obviously wouldn't have those students as open enrollment they'd be included in in our projection but you may have more students that from a, an area that was also changed also elect that school so you could have a net number be a positive or a negative number from from what we're projecting obviously. correct correct but and I do understand that but we the current proposed boundary changes do not change Barry Goldwater's boundaries, correct? Well, technically, there is a minor change to Barry Goldwater High School up in the very north. It's a conforming change for the change that was made uh, for the Desert Mountain Elementary School, but there are currently no students, or there's, there's no population in the area that was changed. But okay. technically, that area did change. Okay, so the area did change, change, but we don't have any students there that are changing with that boundary change. So That is correct. But we just owned a whole nother school to Barry Goldwater. But those students are already in the Barry Goldwater boundaries. Because what Sonoran Foothills and Norterra Canyon are both um, within the Barry Goldwater High School boundaries. And what we did was put, we're building a new school that is a K-8 and we're taking from Sonoran Foothills and Norterra Canyon. And please correct me if at any point I misstate something. And we are taking some of their boundary and giving them to the new school, which means all of that land is still, all of those homes and those families are still within the Barry Goldwater High School boundary. They're just going to go to a different, some of those children are still going to go to a different K-8 potentially. But as high school students, they're on. But the as high school students, their high school is not changing. Their home high school is not changing. That is correct. We're also changing the Esperanza Elementary School as well. So there's three schools, three elementary schools. I apologize, and Esperanza. Thank you for correcting the record. Yes. Okay, but if we knew Barry Goldwater was the one that was going to exceed immediately, why didn't we change that boundary? Because to Ms. O'Brien's point, what I read, what Dr. Brown, or Dr. Brown had said, he was looking at the changes in enrollment based on where students attend, not where students live. So if we were using that projection and we already knew Barry Goldwater was over, I mean, I, I don't think Mr. Miglarino wants to go on a boundary change to Oregon in a few years. Why didn't we just change Barry so we'd have room there? Um, President Ordway, uh, Ms. Tweedy, so the, the actual recommendation includes um, a provision to delay a high school. So I, it will happen sometime in the future. And I know that this question came up during the study session. Uh, I just know that it's, well, with this change, we would hope that it'd be more than five years into the future. Um, 
if this doesn't change, then it causes uh, more of a capacity issue uh, because the student population would not be balanced at the five schools. Um, in the event that we build a high school number six in the future, it would uh, eliminate the need for us to change another boundary. Uh, we can do that likely with fewer high schools being impacted uh, when high school number six actually does get built. So that was a provision that we included is to preserve that so that high school six would have the least amount of impact on the number of um, high school boundaries when that is built sometime into the future. But I, I would want to prevent the need for high school six by doing the boundaries right now. Um, President Orway, Ms. Tweedy, I don't know that I could guarantee that we would never build high school number six. Well, once we have more than 12,000 high school students, I don't know that we can accommodate them in the five existing high schools that we have. Um, so once we get to a point of over 12,000 students, we would have to either expand the existing campuses um, or provide for some other alternative for the students. But, but on our own projections, that wasn't projected in the next 10 years to even happen with the old numbers and with the new numbers. Let's see here. 2,400, 2,700, 2,700 is 13,000. We have 13,000 capacity at all our high schools. And according to our own numbers, projected into 10 years was at like 11,500. So we would have over 1,000 if we did this right. We shouldn't need to build the high school. Um, I can comment there. It's really, um, you're on the right trail, uh, but it's, it's when students move to your district, they don't all uh, come in spread out over the system. We might get an influx of third graders, and that happens at the local school level as well. So even if we hit 12,000 or 13, whatever the number, the magic number is, they are going to be in different zones. So we know we are growing north and we know we're growing west. So um, if we continue to grow north, at what point does it become inconvenient, as we talked about in our other uh, session, to bus a kid all the way down to the bottom of the district uh, to fill a high school, for example. So that's, that's the, the nature of, an, of growth. You don't know where it's going to happen. You have a good suggestion or a good uh, guess what zone it will go in. So um, we believe with this move, it will balance us up. Uh, better than we are today, and we'll put off that uh, need to have a high school in the immediate future. So that's that's the goal. In five years, we'll probably have a different discussion, but this is our best guess for into the future. I, I would like to, I mean, I guess, and I won't take up any more of people's times, but I would like to see us come back with a better plan that balances Barry Goldwater and um, it would be more fiscally responsible. I do agree that Deer Valley needs more students. I agree that when you have more students, you can offer more equity of programs, but it makes no sense to me looking at, and to your point, if we grew to the north, we should be building Boulder, Boulder Creek, which it said it was not going to be at capacity. And also Sandra Day wasn't going to be at capacity with these changes with the old numbers. And now they came back with new numbers that were higher than with the square foot. So I just think the responsible thing, because that was my whole reason for supporting boundary changes, was I don't want to build new schools. I think it just wastes millions of dollars. Right, and that's why we're doing it. That's our whole point as well. Okay. So, so with that, I mean, I would just hope that other board members would support me in this, that we relook at Barry and just do it once, do it right. Yeah, I, I, we've been here twice before, and I don't think that, uh, as we did in the study session with Dr. Brown and Rick's, uh, Rick's name escapes me, Rick Bramer, um, this is their best judgment going into the future. And they're also the uh, district, uh, Mr. Miglarino, um, he's gonna forget more than I know about boundaries. And this is his best judgment as well, looking into the future. So we can keep kicking the can down the road, but it is not going to improve the current situation. And we think our model, if we, if we don't adopt this model, it'll only exacerbate the problem into the future. Mrs. Reed. I just have a couple of comments that I made before at the 
the work session, but I don't feel like they um, were, I feel like they were just dismissed. Um, in regards to the Barry Goldwater High School boundary, at the work session, I said that parent choice has fixed our boundary for us. And for whatever reason, and there's a million reasons I've heard that students from the Sonoran Foothills, Norterra area choose to go to different high schools, they're not choosing to go to Barry Goldwater High School first, which is where they're zoned to go. And so to me, that's an issue that I would like to investigate or look at further to figure out what as a district we can do to try and help parents make a informed decision on what high school is going to be the best for their student, whether it is O'Connor or Boulder Creek or Barry Goldwater in that that region. That's the three high schools that the, the students go to. Um, I feel like that wasn't specifically addressed and, and I get it with the potential for a new high school. However, when I moved in 2004, we said we were getting a new high school and obviously we don't have a new high school and we can't control, you know, um, growth in the real estate market and X, Y, and Z. And, and I get it. It's just that this whole community of thousands of students have all thought that at some point they were going to get this high school. And so because they haven't gotten this high school of, of, of their choice to be built, where it was said it was going to be built for all of these years, they've chosen to go to a different school. I don't think Barry Goldwater is an inferior high school um, to O'Connor or to Boulder Creek. They all, they're all very unique and they're all very different in their own right. And they all have strengths and they all have weaknesses. Every high school does. My concern is that with declining enrollments at Barry Goldwater and at Deer Valley High School, and I'm not talking about projected or um, school facility board numbers, I'm talking about actual students who go to the, choose to go to that school, is that there's a perception issue that I feel like we're still kind of dancing around. And Deer Valley High School is not a bad high school. Barry Goldwater isn't a bad high school. So what, again, can we do as as a community to try and put a plan together to help when we address these boundaries to help get the word out about how great the school is. So, so Mrs. Reed right now, what, and I know, you know, this is what we're doing. We're discussing boundaries, not how we're going to, to, to change perception. So, so I don't believe That's what I, I'm going to speak. I don't believe that what you s said at the study session or what any of us said about, marketing and changing perception or giving a better perception of the high schools was ignored. I don't think that that is going to be part of this conversation. It will be part of a, a bigger, deeper, more meaningful conversation once the boundaries are addressed. It's, it's just not, th this is not the, the portion that we're, we're talking about perception. No, I, I, I understand that. But what I'm, the point that I was trying to make, and excuse me if I went off on a tangent, was that with the, the perception issue is what's, what's fixed that boundary for Barry Goldwater. That's the reason that Barry Goldwater is not exploding. And that's the reason why I feel like we as a, as a district didn't look at changing that because the students aren't actually going there. So... <laughs> the other the other thing that I would and I guess I can talk about that in open enrollment so that's all this is right well I, I do share um, Ms. Tweedy's concerns about the cost of building a new high school and not adjusting boundaries to the north I mean we'd have to pass another bond and we don't know if we can do that. So um, I'm also concerned that I, we have been given several different sets of projections and numbers to look at. So if I'm, un I just want to make sure I'm understanding correctly that the bullet points or the statements from Dr. Brown were using different numbers than the numbers you got from the principal. Is that correct? But, am I understanding Frank, that correctly? That is correct. Okay. So then the, the bullet points uh, in the statement made in that email 
may change or he might have changed those statements had he had the, the principal's numbers to look at. Is that? that is uh, obviously, you don't know because you're, you're not him, but that's possible. Um, I, I do have to say it concerns me that we hired a consultant, but we don't have a consistent written report to look at. As a board member, I know with the futures report, we had a very detailed report that was created, and that was a much more complex topic. Um, it, but it does concern me. Typically, when um, an independent outside consultant is hired, it's to get that outside um, set of eyes on the problem. And as a board member, I don't have a formal report. I've never had one to review although we did talk in detail at right. the study session. So um, I, I agree we need to send more students to Deer Valley High School for equity of programs. There, there's many things in this proposal that I can support, but um, if we're not looking at fixing that problem to the north, it's not really, we're not really going to have equity across across the boundaries. Um. So that's that's my concern as well. Well, how the consultant works in, and you saw it live, um, as we, when Mr. Miglarino works with the two consultants, it's um, really sitting around a computer and doing different scenarios and so then, then it gets translated to a PowerPoint. Then it's, bring, it's brought to you in an update. And they go back to the drawing board just like we did when you said, well, what is the real number of students that it could be at a, um, a capacity that Ms. Tweedy asked? So we went and asked the principals because of Westmac, because of online, et cetera, et cetera. So um, that, um, that question um, was the answer came from my uh, personal um, awareness about the capacity of a school, knowing the principals. So I've had the best people to ask would be where the limit is would be the high school principal. So that's where it comes from. So that's a great example of how this works. It's, this is our best guess as um, people that do this. They, those guys do that for a living. This is what they're saying. The guiding principles that you gave them, they spent months on it and arguably years from the last round doing the exact same thing in the effort to balance the school. And then to Miss Tweedy's point, she wanted to know what are the possibilities of putting off this scenario in the future. And that's um, how it got tweaked again. So every time they come to you in a PowerPoint with all that data, that's all from the demographer. So, so Mr. Mr. Miglarino, we've talked a lot about um, what will happen when we do this. Um, and uh, Dr. Finch, maybe um, Dr. Galligan and Dr. G might want to, um, or Z might want to add to it. What happens when we don't do this? Uh, President Ordway, um, what, uh, what will happen with no change to the um, high school boundaries is that Deer Valley High School will get smaller uh, and it will be difficult to continue to offer a comprehensive um, program for the students at, at that high school. Uh, and we will continue to see pressure at uh, Sandra Day O'Connor uh, High School um, in, in which families will um, not get the opportunity to, to attend the school of their choice. Um, so I, I don't know what will happen as a result of that. Um, well, I, I didn't mean like exactly. I'm just in your best guess. So if Deer Valley gets smaller and their um, offerings also follow suit, would not um, Mountain Ridge and O'Connor, when they're as big as they are without any alleviation, also have the larger um, classes and also the teachers more teachers with six fifths and all that other kind of stuff that we don't think about or talk about when we don't um, level attendance out. Yeah, and, and uh, just so that I not misquoted, uh, at the very tail end of the projection out into the 27, 28, 28, 29 school years, 
there starts to be an uptick in Deer Valley High School. Um, so it does grow eventually, but still uh, we would have them uh, at 1,735 students at the peak uh, out to 28, 29 with no change. Um, but we would still have uh, Sandra Day O'Connor uh, High School uh, well over 2,800 students. And per the principal's determination, he believes that they can have 2,700 students, which is likely going to be problematic starting next year. <coughs> Dr. Galligan, did you want to add anything to that? Well, you probably don't, but would you? Yeah, President Ordway, I would agree with uh, Mr. McLarino. When a campus gets uh, smaller, um, programs uh, are no longer viable because the enrollment, there isn't enough enrollment to maintain a teaching staff. And conversely, when a campus gets so large, as, as you noted, um, teachers then go on six-fifths. And there's nothing wrong with six-fifths. However, when it's an ongoing um, situation on a campus that we haven't found a teacher or uh, the space doesn't adequately um, allow us to, to have teachers in classrooms, they're, they're in different places, um, that impacts a uh, teacher, their, their um, health and their ability to continue, but not only that, it impacts kids. And, and that's the bottom line. So being able to balance our five high schools um, better than they are right now gives us the opportunity to ensure that programs are equitable across all five campuses and we can maintain the, the workload of our teachers better than uh, relying on six-fifths. Dr. Z. Yeah, I would add to uh, President Ordaway as well that um, we perhaps risk as well losing parents uh, who will look other, uh, to other schools if certain schools get too big. And so when we look at the pressure, as Mr. Biglarino mentioned, on certain high schools, that we wouldn't want to lose uh, parents in those zones that say, ah, perhaps I need to find something uh, different that's smaller. And so, again, emphasizing the point that the balance is important. All right, Dr. Finch, and then if we've got anything. Just my, um, I want to thank you for um, asking all the good questions and, and challenging the numbers and challenging our thought. I appreciate it. Um, it's part of the process. But um, uh, that being said, one of the tasks you gave me when I arrived was to address this issue. And so, and this is, I think, our third time we've been to this finish line without crossing the tape. And um, to Ms. Reed's point, the economy crashed. And so that changed everything. And the economy may crash again. And we will not have to worry about this. But this is um, the best judgment we have from the experts that do this for a living. And um, Mr. Miglino has been through this one twice. So he know, already knew uh, where the tough issues would be. But this is my recommendation as your superintendent. This is best for the um, future of Deer Valley Unified School District. Mrs. O'Brien. I wanted to thank all the community members who came to the study session last week. And I think that we, the discussions and comments and emails have allowed us to make some adjustments to this. And I appreciate all the hard work of the cabinet members and my fellow governing board members and asking hard questions and thoughtfully considering everything. Um, I, I think is it, it's important to me that we got it this far. And I, I think that it, it's time for us to, to vote um, f on it and, and make a decision one way or the other. I, I would just be transparent with where I'm standing on this. So I, I do agree <coughs> we need equity at the high schools, but, and I do think we've made a good start and I, and I, in the community meetings. And I agree with what we're doing with the west side of the district with Ridge and Deer Valley. And I do think we need to have equity with programs. But when we started this, and I know Ms. Frank and I, with even the vote on the last elementary, 
We said we wanted to see boundaries. We want to quit building new schools when we have not increased in our capacity enough to justify that. We keep ending up with a larger excess capacity. And to miss um, O'Brien's point when she said that, you know, having this current board address it so it wouldn't be a legacy for future boards. We know we didn't fix the North. Our consultant said we didn't fix the North. We didn't even have the right numbers when the consultant looked at it. All of these schools have more capacity than the consultant realized. And he didn't even have the right numbers when he gave us, I don't want to call it a report, but an email. And I think we can do better. And I don't understand why we wouldn't go back and relook at Sandra Day, Boulder Creek, and Barry Goldwater because this was based on attendance. It took into account the open enrollment trend already. And it said Barry Goldwater didn't have room and Sandra Day and Boulder Creek did. The only reason not to balance those is to set up a new board to either change boundaries again or spend a hundred million dollars on a new high school. And I don't know why we wouldn't fix that and then vote on this. Go ahead. Um, so I, I would just like to say I agree 100% with Dr. Galligan that we need to ensure equity of programs at Deer Valley, their attendance at a level that we can support them in that way. And, and um, I've been extremely vocal about um, my experiences with the school and my thoughts on the quality of the school. I know there are people out there who still disagree with me. Um, but looking at the over at the email that was uh, forwarded or copied into from Dr. Brown, and this really gives me pause, is the statement at the end, while the proposed boundary changes reduce some overcrowding, the changes only partially solve the problem. Something or a combination of things must be done to relieve Sandra Day or Mountain Ridge, new square footage, restricting open enrollment, attendance area change. Um, and so that really gives me pause. A additionally, the fact that we've been working with several different sets of numbers, and uh, I fully support the the changes uh, to Deer Valley um, to to boost uh, increase their enrollment. But I do also have concerns about the capacity at Barry Goldwater, um, as well as the capacity at Sandra Day. So um, I think that's um, my two cents. That's a good point. Um, I. I've been talking about this since the beginning, and I think you mentioned in my last Friday update, the SFP numbers and the principal's numbers are two different uh, guesses um, using their different formulas. Obviously, the human one being uh, the principal's view. Um, as I mentioned in my Friday update, just because your car says when you buy it, it seats six or seats eight, doesn't mean you run around on a trip with a hundred with a capacity of eight people in it for a 180 day field trip. That means that it's, as Dr. Galligan alluded to, it puts stress on the system. So I don't think, even though the principals are saying this is the lid 2700, as your superintendent, I'm not recommending that we run those schools to the lid. It's just not good for the system. Um, the lunchroom stops working, the line stop working at the bookstore, um, et cetera, et cetera. And so that's where they, that's their best guess of where the lid is. So um, the SFB numbers were probably more realistic what a high school should be running at. So to, to your point, um, we did that special project, put the principals on the thing and said, give me your best guess for the sole purpose of saying, if we can, five years from now, hold off a high school two, three more years, what's that magic number from their best perspective? So that's where that came from. It was a special project that you gave us. And so that's why, um, in, in reality, it's not based on anything except a human guess, and that's from our principals. SFB is done through, the, um, through their formulas. And, and then I've... Uh Ms. Reed has nothing. It would probably be time to call the vote. Oh, I just have a question for Dr. Finch. Okay, so in the this this is what I, I'm really trying to follow you guys. In a, the board report a few weeks ago, 
it sounded like you were saying that the um, state facilities board makes the capacity intentionally high on high schools so they don't have to build new schools. Like the, the, that would be, I, I could go back and read your, yeah, no, but that. you said something about so that they make those numbers. They don't want to build new schools. They don't want to fund new schools. Nobody can get at capacity. Yeah, that's a different. Then Mr. Miglarino says M M that. Ms. Tweedy, could, uh, you asked one question. I didn't ask a question. I made a statement. Right. I'm getting to why I have a question. I, I can answer it. For you. Uh, but that wasn't a question. I don't know what you're answering. You said that. Well, the statement was incorrect, so I was going to correct okay. you. Go ahead. Go. go. Oh, no, what I was talking about in the particular to that email was the ineptness of the school facilities board in general, mainly in the rural parts of Arizona, not necessarily in our sector their value um, on the system of how they calculate their numbers. In general, they are, they want to delay the growth of building new schools in general. And so um, whether the numbers, uh, this is a common uh, issue with, especially for rurals where they can't pass, pass bonds. And so instead of um, allowing them to build schools, they hold, artificially hold those that propo those proposals down, which in turn turns into overcapacity at school. So it's not exactly the same, but the concept is the similar. They want to compress um, those numbers. I don't know Mr. Miguelino wants to fill in that on that, but I just talked about that today with my legislator. So that's a problem, especially in rural Arizona. But then Mr. Miglarino said that the school facility board only includes in the um, square footage the funding they gave for schools and not the square footage you built with bonds. So the schools are actually much larger than the school, school facilities board thinks they are. So then those two sentences, those two statements didn't make sense to me to, it, it, together. And then Mr. Riglarino calls the principals, asks them how many students fit in their schools which would seem like we'd have it on the front end, but the boundary expert would need that to actually do this project. But we find out on the back end, and now we're disagreeing with those numbers and saying we wouldn't actually put that many people in our schools. We would spend $100 million when our own projections show we would have room probably for another 1,500, 20 years if we just did this right. I, I don't know. I'm just I'm yeah. frustrated. Well, I reason, totally agree with everything that happened on the west side of the district. Right. I'm just baffled by the, the the other side of the district. The reason why the SFB doesn't include uh, the bonds or why it becomes a convoluted mess is because, in particular, rural schools cannot pass bonds. So that's part of their problem. We have passed bonds and been able to build um, the space. So the SFB... Um, just uses their formula for the stuff that they do, not anything related to bonds. So that's why we have, in particular in our district, where we can pass bonds, you get a different number from the SFB. That's what Mr. Miglarino was referring to. Uh, President Orway, if I could just, the, uh, um, the SFB capacity is convoluted two ways. One is they don't count bond um, built items um, but they also have their own set of standards so uh, for example a performing arts building is not part of the standard and they don't fund it um, at auxiliary gym not part of the standard um, they don't fund it uh, but all of our high schools have both a performing arts building and an auxiliary gym uh, they also don't fund a stadium uh, just for that's not square footage but just another example of the standards when they provided funding to us, they provided funding for 250,000 square feet uh, towards the standard, um, but we only built 214,000 square feet, for example, at uh, Sandra Day O'Connor High School. But they're counting 250,000 square feet against our capacity. But then they're excluding another 60,000 square feet of performing arts and auxiliary buildings. That So it, it, it's... I guess the long and short of it is the school facilities board. Uh, the school facilities board capacity is a number that's derived by a specific formula um, that is flawed as much as any other projection of what the capacity of a high school would be at. 
but it is a stated capacity that can be found by looking at the School Facilities Board website. Okay. And then the principals, again, came up with their numbers, and they were counting brick-and-mortar students that are there for eight periods or seven periods, or how did that work, or do we even know how we got those numbers? Dr. Z, uh, were you there for who, who was there for that? President Ordway, um, the, it, it, I actually had a, I sent an email to the principals after the study session last week. Mm -hmm. I had a conversation with them, um, and they met collectively to be able to kind of look at that. I also analyzed what the capacity of the, or what the actual enrollment was going back to 2006. Uh, I believe that was the first year that Boulder Creek High School had all four grade levels mm -hmm. uh, at it. Um, anything prior to that, then we had, you know, adjustments because we were opening schools and making changes. I looked at what the maximum number of students was on uh, what we call the 40th day or October 1 enrollment reports. I um, also looked at the minimum number of day or member, minimum number of enrollment and the average enrollment and uh, made sure that the information we were getting from the principals actually uh, coincided with what we've seen historically for the last 13 years. Okay, go ahead and then this is just a good, but I, I just want to make sure I understand the recommendation before us was based on the school facilities board numbers. Is Am I understanding that correctly? Uh, President Orway, Ms. Frank, the email that you're referring to was dated prior to the uh, study session and is based on SFB capacity numbers. The recommendation that we have proposed presented to you is based on our best estimate of the capacity of the high schools. Okay, thank you. With all the facts that were given to us at the study session. Yes? Correct. Oh, go ahead. Oh. All right, I'm gonna call for the vote. Um, although I'm sorry. Uh, if you're in favor, say aye. If you are opposed, you may say. You need to do the motion to accept the administration. Have you, have you done that? Yet? I, I did the motion at the, the, the beginning motion. of the discussion. That's why we were discussing it. Okay, thanks. Unless you want to read it again, so we know what we're voting on again, because it's been a while. Um, so the motion on the table is that the governing board accept the administration recommendation to approve change the high school boundaries, including the development of the transitional plan per the attached presentation. If you're in favor, say aye. If you are not, nay. And if you're abstaining, abstain. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Can I explain my vote, please? Sure. Um, I am in favor of um, adding more students to, to Deer Valley High School. Um, I do have some concerns about parts of the transition plan um, that I'm hoping there are more logistics. So I'm hoping that after um, the vote, if it passes, that those um, logistics might be addressed. I know that they're not necessarily a governance issue. It's more of an operational issue. But I do have concerns about student parking, especially for juniors and seniors. Um, and I have concerns about... Um, ensuring that we have um, a guiding principle for balancing open enrollment issues. Um, so with that, I vote aye. Abstain. Abstain. All right, next. Okay, so we're at uh, item 5B. I move that the governing board accept the administration to approve the revised list of qualifying positions for the results-based funding payment. A second. All those in favor say aye. 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 No nays, so let's go on to six. A, I think. I'm right. waiting for the vote to pop up. Oh. Oh. So we are. Before I read the next motion. Oh, there Not it is. On. Oh, there it is. Ah. Okay, so item 5C, I move that the Governing Board approved recommended language changes to policy JFB open enrollment. Second. Happy birthday, and it's your turn. Thank you. 
For real, it's her birthday. It is my birthday. Thank you. Um, good evening, President Ordway, Governing Board members, Superintendent Finch. Um, I'm going to draw your attention to the papers that you have in front of you and focus on the revisions that we made over the last couple of weeks to Policy JFB, specifically to the Board's request that we differentiate um, trans in district transfer students with students that would be applying for open enrollment outside of the school district. So I took the policy, if you look at the second page of the policy that you have on, on JFB and on PowerPoint, I just, what I, this is the same PowerPoint that you did see a couple of weeks ago. What I did change in here is that anything that was specific um, in the policy that I pulled apart, if you, if you recall, ASBA did recommend that you take your transfer students first and then you take your out of district students. And what I had done to the policy is combined them to mirror the policy that we currently have. And so what I did is I separated it again. And you'll see that here throughout the policy. Um, if you look at the second page where it says A at the bottom, it still does say resident and non-resident transfer pupils have priority if they already have been accepted for open enrollment. We will not um, cause them to leave their campus if they are still on open and um, that the, the following year. Other than that change throughout the policy, there have been no other adjustments and the regulation still looks like you saw it last. I have a question if you're ready for questions. I'm ready. Okay, so earlier we spoke about, or we heard, and we've been getting emails and, and questions about capacity, how that is um, affecting, or apparently we're affecting our students at high IAPs and 504s that live in our district that want to open enroll. So can you explain that, please? Okay. I can explain that. So our policy does um, state that we accept open enrollment based on capacity. That's um, statutory, and we mirror that in our policy. Capacity is programmatic, and it um, so it can be by grade level. And in general education, it is on grade level. It also can be based on program. So there are different processes we go through for students that apply into the Renaissance program on open enrollment, for example or apply to go to Gavilan Peak and participate in the Mandarin program and the Campus 31. We are currently putting in pro processes in place for our resident students to first apply into that program and then open enrollment students to apply into that program and it is going to be based on capacity of that program for gen ed and special education students. For students who are on IEPs, student, su student support services does review IEPs to determine capacity and the availability of resources on that campus. And that is um, specific to staffing, the number of special education teachers that we do have and services needed, sometimes transportation as well. I do wanna note that uh, around four years ago, the Office of Civil Rights did take look at our open enrollment um, practices and looked at special education students and general education students and did rule that we follow the law and we follow our policy consistently and fairly with special education students and general education students. In other words, we do not discriminate against special education students in our practice. So when we had the parent talking about having their student at a specific school for many years, how would that all of the sudden change being in the same school for the roll up year knowing that it's important for consistency for all students, mm -hmm. but certainly for our students that have special needs and want to continue on that level playing field. So President Ordway, governing board member, policy does not require that students reopen and or reapply the following year. What is causing this right now is the potential of the boundary change. And so if a student is at a campus and their boundary becomes different 
then they no longer are a resident student of the campus they are currently um, attending this year, that boundary change could cause them to now need to go to a new campus as their home campus, and they would need to apply for open enrollment back to the campus. And have we had that talk with our um, parents or guardians of our students with special needs? Has there been any kind of, uh, hey, you might have to go here? Um, it, I'm going to let someone else talk because this is just like, I, I cannot, if all of what was said tonight was absolutely accurate, um, for it to come as a surprise to someone or even an eventuality with knowing that these students are not on level playing ground unless we provide that to them and whether or not legally balancing this is what is what we should do sometimes that's right doesn't mean that it's something we have to do but it's something we should do mm -hmm. so can can you answer that and then go ahead so I think the first part of your question is communication where the family is aware that this might be what is going to occur and I would say that through our boundary conversations we did we did um, provide this type of information we have received questions since those meetings from both general education families and special education families specific though to um, the processes of what that looks like that it travels to student support services or that a campus might explain to a parent that it goes through um, a of review an applicant might go through another layer of review who's in a special program or a student who is on an i i can't tell you that they that we did a good job communicating the details of what that looks like um, during that phase okay so I, I was at some of the boundary change meetings I don't, nothing sticks in my head that someone said students of our parents, guardians with students that have support special specialists will need to, we're going to do this. We're, we're going to talk to you. We're going to explain to you. And we also talked about transition, natural transition between a K, uh, kinder, or preschool, kindergarten to first grade and, and so on and so forth. Yes. This would be a almost an unnatural transition that I don't know that, you know, that we've planned for. And Ms. Frank, go ahead after okay. Ms. Moffitt speaks. Did you want to? I, I, I don't recall the second portion of your original question. It was about the communication in the second portion. Can you was the transition, me? which is now going to be an unnatural transition. And we, we have pla things in place for those that are natural transitions from K through three, six to nine, or, or siblings so and eighth graders. No, no, no. I'm I'm talking about special ed in general. We have those transitions for our students. Yes, we do. For feeding campuses, we do have transition plans. Right. For, from so those would be natural transitions. But now, if we're doing this, this would be an unnatural transition, and I don't know that we had a planned for that well part of our problem maybe i can help fill in some of the um thoughts here too is um the board hadn't voted yet so we didn't want to get everyone all worked up on if, if the board votes no then obviously we've got everyone all worked up so w tomorrow is when all this communication starts full court press and then we talked a little bit about um, miss allred and about um the different way we're going to identify students and get the process started so um, one of the problems about trying to um, project into the future is you have a possibility of having incorrect information. So um, that we do, we did talk in generalities and processes, as Ms. Um, Moffat's talking about. This is the process for IEPs of uh, this type of student. This is the process for the Gen Ed student. And as she mentioned, we've been audited, and this is a correct process. So it's more communication of the process, not the individual students. Tomorrow, we'll begin the, uh, the communication of the individual student um, and to the individual parent. If that makes sense. I don't. 
I would also, is that okay? I'd yeah, also ahead. like to add that we did uh, at pre K 12, we did communicate to all administrators what this was going to look like. And Peggy and I also communicated with the campuses that we believed would be directly impacted by this at the elementary level. So we did speak with Norterra Canyon, we have spoken with Trisha Graham, and we have also spoken with Sonoran Foothills. And it okay, Ms. Frank. So it, it seems to me we have two issues here. We have the issue of just general open enrollment. So if a family outside of, and we'll just, I'll just throw out North Hara Canyon um, just because. So let's say someone outside of North Hara Canyon had a student with an IEP and they wanted to open enroll and there was not capacity uh, in the special ed program for that student, then Yes, I could understand why open enrollment would be either waitlisted or, or denied because there weren't sufficient staff or, or programming available to meet that student's needs. However, that's not the case with the parents who've spoken to us tonight. You have students who are at, we'll just throw out Norterra Canyon again, um, Norterra Canyon. They are not coming from outside of that boundary. Um, we are saying to pa other parents of non-special needs students, there is a transition plan where your student can remain on open enrollment. We know how many, or we should be able to find out, how many special education students are going to be impacted by the boundary change and might need to stay at Norterra Canyon and then staff appropriately because the staffing should follow the students. The students shouldn't follow the staffing, in my opinion. I, Ms. Frank, we, I also, just, we also have another variable is the new school will attract students away so um, it's the chicken or the egg we know that's what we know where we will know where everyone will want to go soon and then we'll be able to adjust accordingly I don't miss Moffat you want to fill in there I, I would like to point out um, something to consider because it is something that we could put into a plan similarly to how um, we did for eighth graders going into high school and 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 grandfathering the high school students we this is true for general education students too it it, it can happen on the general education side that they are applying to come back in but we do not have the capacity and so they also sit on a wait list so we do need to be fair to both, and that is, is why um, the OCR decided that we were treating everyone fairly is w what we did for general education students, we did for special education students. So if we were to s say that we were going to allow all special education students to stay and um, not have to reopen and roll in, we, I feel we would need to do the same for the general education students or, or perhaps get a legal opinion would be allowed to do that for special education students and not general education students. So at this moment in time, there are still general education students that are able to open enroll where students with IEPs and 504s are waitlisted. Is that yes or no? It's based on capacity. So there, there is absolutely potential and I can't say, Ms. Ordway, with, with certainty that we have had to wait list a general education student for this reason, but I know that we have in the, in the past. They have, have been forced because of a boundary. No, I was just talking about right now, at this moment in time. At this moment, I can't tell you that. I don't have that data with certainty in, in my mind, but I can find it for you. I can get it for you. Um, then I would like to know um, how many special education students uh, could potentially be impacted by this boundary change and then what staffing would be required to provide them with the consistency in their education because while you're correct it may seem like it wouldn't be fair to treat special education students uh, differently or special needs students or students with disabilities uh, differently and, and allow them all to stay um, the fact is they have different needs in the general population. And for a parent of a special needs student to be on a wait list is extremely stressful. And I've always kind of come from the point of view of fair isn't when everyone gets treated the same, fair is when everyone gets what they need. And so I realize this is a complex issue, but I think it would behoove us to actually look at the numbers. How many students are we talking to? 
five, ten, how many of those parents want to stay at the school they're at or might be happy to go to the, the, the new boundary? And then can we accommodate the ones that feel it's extremely important for their children to stay? You're on the same trail we are. I totally agree with you. And again, we will know more as we contact the parents and ask and tell them scenario and ask them where they want to go. And that's one of the jobs of Ms. Allred is to, to chase down all of those different scenarios. So um, that um, is a as a variable. You're on the right page, uh, the right idea though. We we will know more as the cho students choose the new school or the, the neighboring schools. And to your point too, I think I'm um, and Ms. Moffitt's, I think a legal opinion would help us here as well. Ms. Reed. Thank you. Um, I would say that, in my opinion, because we were doing so many things so quickly, that this was a part of a piece of the pie that we missed, that all of us missed, and that even the parents missed until they got their letter saying that they were waitlisted. I don't think that at any point in the presentations at the boundary meetings, um, kids with special needs was ever addressed. It, it it wasn't. I have a kid with special needs. I would have caught my attention. It wasn't addressed in any of those. Um, I can tell you from the emails and the conversations that I've had with parents, had they known that this was an extra step in the process for them, they would have raised concerns at um, to the board prior to us voting on boundaries. <coughs> that I went back through um, the emails and I didn't get any emails from any parent with special needs questioning whether or not their student would be able to stay. Um, with that being said, um, looking at Peoria's open enrollment policy, um, when they have their admission standards, they go out and they list a little bit more as far as the things that um, that they look at. So they look at the physical capacity of the school building and classrooms, the availability of staff members to serve as students at each site, capacity and relevant special programs, and availability of other resources. Um, I will tell you that in my IEP meetings, um, I have not heard anything in regards to um, an open enrollment policy or if I wanted to open enroll my student at a different school. Um, so that might be a great place because you have a captive audience and we're talking about, you know, the future of your student and transitions and, and the best placement. That might be a great um, place to explain to parents what the what our process or policy for open enrollment is. Um, most parents out there don't understand or don't realize that there are a second or third or fourth set of eyes that look at the open enrollment request for a student with special needs. So if there is a way that we can, um, bless you, there is a way that we can help clarify that so parents understand, I think that would be extremely helpful. Um, I, I, I feel terrible that I didn't consider that, that that wasn't something that was even in my brain, that um, that we would be putting parents in in this position, um, it, it is a it is a it's something that I hope that um, as a district and as a board that we can come together and try and and find a solution for um, for these students. Second, we have a, another issue, in, in my opinion, as far as the open enroll open enrollment policy for any special needs students, not just students that are affected by our, our boundary transition here, is that it would be, in my opinion, would be helpful if when a parent and a student might not have a good fit at a school and they, they're feeling like their, their needs and the, they're not getting the services that they want or they think that they should have, that there might be another process in place to help them find a um, more suitable placement within our district rather than um, 
having the <clears throat> angst and the fighting that goes on, um, or I shouldn't say fighting, the mediation process that goes on sometimes in IEP meetings that go down the road of an OCR or the student leaving the district on an ESA. So I'm hoping that we can come together to figure out if there is another way to keep these students within our district so we don't lose them. But, and I know that it's it's tricky, right? Because we have capacity issues with special needs programs. You know, we don't have enough um, special ed teachers. We don't have enough paras and I get it. But my concern is we aren't providing um, the necessary resources for our students and their leaving. And I would like to keep our, our students because we do have some really great special education teachers and we do have great programs at our schools and I'd like to allow them the opportunity to maybe try one of those before they just pack up and go someplace else. Yeah. We have, uh, our numbers are showing that they're continuing to climb. So um, leaving them, leaving us is, doesn't seem to be the trend but to your point, though, we still can always get better in our communication with the parents. So totally agree. Yes, Ms. Treaty. I, I guess I'll combine a little bit of this with that. I, I just think I know we brought this policy and verbiage forward because it was put forth by ASBA and, and many of the, their policies I, I agreed with. And I think it saves us legal fees. However, I do think when we adopt a policy it shows our values as a board. It's a reflection on us. And when things happen um, that maybe we don't agree with and, and statements are made, usually it's like we acted in accordance with the state law and the board's policies. So if something's happening in practice that we don't agree with, then it's on us to make sure our policies address it. I can say I would not even if we're being legally compliant, I don't believe that that aligns with my sense of how students with disabilities should be treated. But I think we would address it in our policy. But I also wanted to talk about the revocation because I did receive the letter that was attached from the VLT and my previous statements on it. So what this all goes to is that when we talk about educational equity, are, are we just making statements that make us sound like nice people or do we actually believe in educational equity? And, and when you think about the charters and all the public educators getting up in arms and the problem with charters isn't necessarily school choice. Competition's good. It, it, it's that schools are choosing students and there's something offensive about that as public educators. If um, we believe we should be in it for all children, the children with disabilities, the children with behavior challenges, um, if we were going to pick teams, and, and, and I think that's what's offensive. The charter schools pick their students and then they brag about what a good job they do. And that's why I don't like um, what we're proposing with the open enrollment policy. And I'm going to go to the point. Um, very well drafted letter from the BLT about why they supported this change to the open enrollment policy. I've received kids who've gotten their open um, open enrollment revoked. They don't go back to their home schools and start behaving. We all have behaviors on every school and, and it went on and talked about the safety of the students and how all these behavior interventions didn't work. Well, the same thing happens with students that live in your boundaries. It's like, it's okay for a student to endanger students as long as they live in the boundary of the school. The, the real problem is we have students that are endangering students at schools and we don't have a great plan for addressing that. Maybe it's an alternative to suspension program if they're gen ed and we even talked about tonight, a lot of times they are gen ed, they have con orders, so they don't, they don't get extra services. But revoking their open enrollment is not the answer. Um, you, you have to, we have to put processes in place for the situations that were outlined in that letter so that whether the students open enrolled or not open enrolled, we have something in place to help that student and to keep other students safe. Getting rid of the 25 kids who maybe are violent 
and keeping the rest that live in your boundaries doesn't solve the problem. You need to do something with violent kids, whether they're open enrolled or not, and keep the other students safe. But what this really is, it's like, if we're going to say that the charter schools are wrong for behaving like this, the public schools need to stand up and say, we're not going to act like the charter schools. We're not going to have students leave midway through the year because they're difficult to educate. Because if you're going to go down there and say that the charters are wrong for doing it while all the public school districts are adopting policies and acting like charters, being hypocrites. I don't, I'll fight this battle all day, but I won't vote for a policy that behaves like Yeah, I think um, you have good points there. Um, we've talked about this one uh, a lot. The, the difference of the charter machine and ours in the, using the open enrollment, for example, is the student will end up going to a Deer Valley to their home school, which has the same curriculum, has the same procedures, et cetera, et cetera. That's the differences um, when the charters deny access to um, their system, they come to the public schools. So in our in our system, if you open and roll, it's you could argue that it's similar to a charter concept. You're asking permission to come to their school. Um, that that concept is probably similar. The difference is um, from the um, once you are your open enrollment is revoked, you still have access to your home school. That's I, the difference. I believe what Miss Tweedy's point was is that the behavior is going to be correct. This, is not going to be corrected or is going to be corrected at either of our district schools. I think that was your point. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. We seem to get more parental cooperation when there is the risk of losing your invitation to the open enroll school that you choose to be at. And that's kind of the letter, the point of the BLT letter. But, but again, though, Dr. Finch, we're cherry picking kids who have involved parents. My most difficult student, and I'm not, you know, obviously going to give names, his parent literally blocked my phone number, wouldn't take calls from the school. You, you got to educate kids whether their parents care or not. That's our job. Correct. To Ms. Tweedy's point, I would just like to add that if we accept or if a campus accepts a student on open enrollment, and particularly if they're from out of the district, we're accepting the money that comes with them, then I feel we've made a commitment to that student for a year. Because when students are displaced in the middle of the year, at the semester's end, or even worse, at a quarter's end, that's not helpful to the student. Um, so while it's frustrating for the adults, the focus is the student. It, I, I have seen firsthand uh, the trauma that is caused when a student is, you know, you, you didn't behave, so now you, you can't stay at this school anymore. We'll send you off to someone else and you'll be their problem. And the, and the student uh, is like, okay, I got kicked out. They didn't want me. That's how a kid will interpret that. I'm bad. They didn't want me. Are they going to want me at my next school? So I don't believe in, I mean, if you take them, I think they're our responsibility for the year. If at, at the end of the year it hasn't worked out, then at that point revoke the open enrollment. But at least you're not disrupting them in the middle of the school year. I think that's wrong. And if there's safety concerns, we need to address those because we need to address them. We can't say it's okay if a student that lives in the boundaries is making us full and safe, but it's not okay. I mean, any student making, if, if there's kids making that campus unsafe, we need to put something in place. That shouldn't be allowed to happen, period, whether the kid resides in or out of the boundary. Okay. Ms. Reed, do you have anything more? And then Ms. O'Brien, if you have anything. Yes. I just have a question. Um, it says that the superintendent shall um, determine how much excess capacity and then the board should approve it. So what currently is the excess capacity that you've determined? It says for open enrollment. For open enrollment. Mm -hmm. um, that's it. I think that's referring to uh, an appeal process. Am I correct? Yes. The, the which process? That she was referring to. You know, it just says it in our policy. I think that came from Miss Tweedy. Miss Tweedy said that um, she would like to, if there was going to be it, that she wanted an appeal process. No, I think. no it's, it's the last page of the policy that you're referencing. It's in the policy. Okay. It, 
The capacity is is based on when the gold budget locks down. So when when the gold budget, or the gold book, which is the budget, <laughs> locks down, that's the FTE that we are allocating at those locations. Additionally to that, the board also approves our uh, <coughs> certified manual on an annual basis, and that's where our class loads are listed. So that's what we monitor staffing on every week, and we bring that staffing into cabinet. And at that point, we review the staffing, we look at whether or not we need to allocate more that direction, and whether or not we can take more open enrollment students. It's all part of that process. And is that ever posted anywhere? As far as what the capacity, I mean, besides in our, besides trying to discern it from our um, enrollment reports, is that... Is that ever posted anywhere on any school of the loads, school? class loads? No, as far as what what the excess capacity might be, so that um, at for I don't parent know, purposes at desert at Desert Sage, they might be able to accept fourteen more mm -hmm. third graders, or mm -hmm. you know. 20 more students total. I mean, is that ever posted anywhere or is that just where we do kind post of an internal it is thing? online. We show where we do not have, where we have limited capacity, where we have open capacity and where we are closed. So that would be mostly for parent use. We do not specify how many slots are open. So where is it posted online? Uh, the open enrollment site. If okay. you go, it, it ha there's a, a matrix that shows all the campuses and indicates which ones are open, which ones are limited. So on, and we maintain that throughout the year. And is that done by program also? No, it is not done by program. It is done by location. And would it be possible if if we were to add that into by doing by program? Um, it, would it be possible to also put in special education numbers? I do think we could do that. And could be more helpful. The way that we do that currently is that it would say limited, but it does not specify why it's limited. So we could do that, and that would be very helpful to the parent. Thank you. I'm going to make a suggestion that we um, table this um, with all the questions that I'm sure Sheila's hand is, you know, done writing or whoever's taken them, plus other uh, questions, because I don't want to totally disrupt the thought process of what you guys put forward, because there are always going to be some more unintended consequences. But at 9:40 at night, with all of these questions, I want to make sure that we're going to do a complete. Um, and thorough job of. Uh, would you like this. a motion to table? Uh, I would. I move that we table item 5C till the next board meeting. I second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, moving on to item 6. I move that the governing board approve consent agenda items 6A through 6I. I second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Okay. So, are you voting for me because it's not popping we, we up? It didn't pop okay. up. Okay. Okay. Did you vote for us? Okay. Seven A. Okay. Seven A. Excuse me while I turn to that page. Oops. I'm on seven B. Sorry. Well, I mean, we're quick. No, we're I, I move that the governing board approve all employee out of state travel per policy GC. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 I move that the governing board approve professional travel for board member Ann O'Brien to attend certification course on education finance. I second. Did we all read the explanation? Or did you want to say anything, or I'm can we vote? I'm happy to answer any questions if anybody has any. I don't have any. I don't have All any. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Oh, look at where we are at AA. How'd that happen? Time flies. Doesn't it? Not there yet. Future meetings and dates, nine. <coughs> Do you have a motion for number nine? I move to adjourn the meeting. Thank you. All those in favor say aye. Second, oh, second. aye. 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 Second, aye.